Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the March 11th Governance and Priorities Committee meeting. I'd like to first recognize you are in the traditional territory of the Snamo First Nation. Our clerk today is Ms. Sheila Gurry. Today's Governance and Priorities Committee meeting will be held in accordance with the Community Charter and Council Procedure Bylaw 2018, number 7272. The question period side up sheet is on the table by the double doors to my left for agenda items only. If during the meeting any member of the gallery has a question regarding an agenda item, please write down your name and the agenda item on the sheet. Members have been granted authority to join meetings electronically, and today we have Councillor Gesselbrack attending electronically. The first item on the agenda is late items. Ms. Gurry. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So for late items today, item four, short-term short rental review, is going to be postponed to a future council meeting. Um, and so that item will be um, put to a council meeting later um, in this month or next. And that's it. Adam Thank Curry. you, Ms. Curry. Motion for the adoption of the agenda is amended. Moved by or Mayor Crow, seconded by Councillor Eastmere. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none opposed, motion carries. Everybody had a chance to look at the minutes. If there's no issues, could I please have a motion for the adoption is circulated? Moved by uh, Councillor Hemmons, seconded by Mayor Krog. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Motion passes, none opposed. Agenda planning, Ms. Curry. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, on your original agenda package, the upcoming topics and initiatives are listed and they're on the screen there for you as well. It goes over um, today's items and the short-term rental review um, will go to a council meeting in the future as just stated. And it shows and lists the upcoming topics and initiatives for the March 25th GPC meeting, the April 29th GPC meeting, and the May 13th GPC meeting. Um, these aren't all set in stone, they could change, but these are the topics that we have um, upcoming, as well as at the very bottom, there's some future topics with dates to be determined still. Um, so if any of you have any questions or would like any additions or um, clarification on any of these topics, now would be the appropriate time. Uh, Councillor Eastmere. Uh, thank you, through you. Uh, the one thing I was expecting to see on here was a discussion around the audit of the downtown safety action plan. Um, I think I was anticipating that would be sometime in April uh, to and loop that in with the discussion around the challenges we're having with um, providing housing for unhoused community members. Ms. Gurry. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Through you to Councillor Eastmere. Um, yes, Mr. LaBerge just brought that to my attention, so we didn't have time to update this, and I should have spoke to that. He has April 29th stated for that um, update of the um, audit review of the downtown and IMO safety plan and pos possible expansion of that. Um, so April 29th tentatively, and we might need to rearrange some of the other items um, to ensure there's room and space in that day. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and the one other item I was wondering about uh, was the discussion around the OV theater. Um, was that going to be coming back to us with the um, potential setup for the Arts Guild that we were talking about? Um, Mr. Harding was saying that they were going to come back with a report. Is that in camera? Okay. I think it gotcha. is. Right, pardon me. Yeah. So uh, if we can just I'll leave that one. hold for a second, I believe that's an in-camera item. Yeah, Leonard's going in camera too. Ms. Osborne. Hello, good afternoon. Um, sorry what the question was, is the no, guild. No, hold right now, just for confirmation. Uh, yes, yeah. Madam Chair, you are correct. So we will get back to yes, the thank council you. when we can about yeah. that matter. Okay. Thank you. It's all right. We're, no, it's okay. It's fine. We're moving on. Any other concerns or comments from council? Um, okay, we're good then. So moving on, uh, we're going to go to Healthy Nanaimo Dam Safety Primer for City of Nanaimo, and that's going to be introduced by Mr. Sims. Thanks, Madam Chair. So just to provide a bit of context, we're currently embarking on our, or in the midst of, I should say, our 10-year dam safety review, which is required uh, as part of the work that we are obligated to do under provincial law when we own 10 separate dams. 
So, and this is really a council and community refresh on the city's obligations under the dam safety regulation. One of the, uh, the things that we know is over the, the lifestyle or lifetime of infrastructure, there's a lot of upgrading and, and uh, continual maintenance and staff are operating under the assumption that we're going to continue to operate, maintain these dams for, for now and well into the future. Um, there's two uh, presenters today. The first one is Mr. Squire, who's our manager of water resources, as you know, and his, uh, under his purview is, is, uh, is dam safety and looking after not only water supply, but the dams associated with those and the recreational dams. He does that in concert with Ms. Davis, as who you also know, uh, for the recreational dams. So I just, one of the things that, uh, and then following Mr. Squire will be Mr. Dave Bonin, who's our consultant with Hatch, uh, in, an expert in dam safety and uh, well regarded across uh, North America in, in, this, in this field. One of the things that I draw your attention to because it's, it's new since um, let's say 2016 or 2017, there's two components to this presentation. One of them is public safety around dams. So, so the, the, the safety of people that are near dams, so we want to keep uh, people away from harm. That's one component, and then the other component, similarly named, which is why I'm highlighting it, is dam safety, the, the whole topic of dam safety. So those rare but catastrophic occurrences where the infrastructure fails and can, can hit down, uh, downstream populations. So there's these two separate components so that you, you'll just be able to watch for that. And, and again, the context of this is just a refresh on the city's obligations. Uh, and. Of course, we welcome questions and look forward to the delegation. Thank you. Mr. Squire. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Sims, and good afternoon. Um, so the purpose of this is just to inform Council of the regulatory requirements and roles and responsibility of dam owners. And I'll go through the dams that we do own, some of the dams that we've inherited. Um, and then we'll look at some of the standards and I'll hand it over to Mr. Bonin to present that. Um, so essentially on a very overview, and again, Mr. Bonin will go into more detail, but the consequences of failure, dams are rated from low to extreme and it depends on four factors. Um, population at risk, that's the downstream population of the risk of a dam failure. And then as morbid as it sounds, it's loss of life as a result of a dam failing, um, the, the higher the loss of life, the more, the higher the rating of the dam. And then they also look at the environmental and cultural impacts and infrastructure losses and losses to the economy as well. So our dams, we have two water supply dams and eight recreational dams within our parks and they're rated from low to very high. Um, again, we have the main water supply dams, I'll talk about those, they have an asset value of around $180 million. And same with our recreational dams, or eight recreational dams, about $20 million in replacement value. Average annual operating cost for water supply is about $290,000, and recreation is about 49000 And that's just to do the re minimum requirements for dam safety, um, to do the reviews that we're regulated to do. Um, starting with Jump Creek, uh, that is our water supply that impounds all the catchment and the impoundment there is enough to supply the city for one year. Um, almost 17 million cubic meters of water supplied up there. Um, the height, there's two, actually two dams. There's a saddle dam which is about 6.7 meters in height. That's an emergency spillway. And then the actual dam itself is 25 meters in height. Going further downstream, nine kilometers downstream, we have the South Fork Dam. That's where our intake is for the city. We have one intake. Uh, currently, right now, that dam is uh, built in 1931. So in, you'll see in the capital plan, uh, several years from now, we're gonna be looking at a seismic uh, study and an upgrade for that and see it's, it's in a fault line. Ironically, if you look at, there's a minor fault line that runs uh, west to east on Vancouver Island or more northeast. Um, if you line up all those fault lines, that's where all of our dams are. <laughs> um, but uh, we'll be looking at that in, uh, in the future. 
And then we have our colliery dams, of course. There's a lot of history there, and built in 1910 uh, to supply the washing for the coal works. We have upper colliery dam. Most people don't recognize that as a dam because you have uh, Nanaimo Lakes Road over top of it. Um, also underneath that road are some significant water supply mains that supply the city. Two-thirds of the water supply goes underneath that road. So we want to be very diligent when we're looking at that, and especially the spillway right now. Even though Upper Colliery Dam is a significant rating, uh, we don't have to look at the full flows going down that spillway. It, it is under capacity and it's something we'll be putting in the capital plan. We'll be do, doing an analysis on that in several years. And Middle Colliery Dam, of course, um, we just had the dam regulator come in uh, a year and a half ago and give us an audit. And he's requesting we put a log boom in front of that too. And it'd be a very simple log boom, like an A-frame stick in front of it. Um, and again, we've got to be very conscientious of the park users and it's a off-leash park for dogs. I know we've had uh, numerous complaints um, about dogs potentially getting washed down there. So it could do two things that can satisfy dam safety requirements. And as Mr. Sims alluded to, provides safety for the public in and around dams as well. Uh, and then we have lower colliery dam at the very end of uh, and a fairly significant drop off spillway that we have. We have the two main spillways, of course, the Labrador spillway that was built um, over eight years ago now, and then the main spillway. And then we have old number one, which that was our water supply for essentially this area in downtown for almost a third of the city. Um, it's uh, a little funny to realize that that was our main water supply almost uh, nine years ago in yeah. open source. Mm -hmm. What we did was we drained it and we lowered the consequence, the hazard rating down to low because it's not full of water and it's not operating right now. But it's still recognized and on the registry for dam safety. And then we have the Harewood Dam. It's a very nice picturesque uh, just below the abyss, um, a little offshoot there. And then Westwood Lake Dam, mostly used by a lot of recreational users, but it's also used by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. There is a siphon that goes, that takes water from the lake and into the one of tributaries and into the Millstone River for an enhancement of uh, flows. And then we have Lindley Valley and that was inherited through the development of uh, one of the Lindley Valley uh, subdivisions up there. And that's one of our newest dams. We've had that uh, almost two and a half years. And Witchcraft Lake, this is outside the city at the toe of Mount Benson. Uh, the dam itself has been partially decommissioned by nature back in the mid fifties. And, but it's still on the registry of dam safety and we still have to monitor it. Um, and we are the owner. And Again, what Mr. Sims has alluded to and uh, Mr. Dave Bonin will talk about is not new, but this is something that we need to do depending on the consequence of failure of our dams is look at having a formal plan about public safety and around dams. And it is separate from BC dam safety regulations. These are guidelines that are put out by the Canadian public uh, safety um, uh, from the, the CDA. Um, we also have insurance, our Municipal Insurance Association will do audits when you're dealing with the public. Um, they've done an audit on our colliery dams. Uh, we've had many deficiencies that we've been trying to address over the last several years that uh, need to get done to satisfy not only dam safety requirements but ensure that we're protecting the public. Um, a lot of fun fencing and signing has been put up over the last couple of years. And then the spillway boom was extended on the middle colliery, or pardon me, the lower colliery dam. And um, the challenges with that is recognizing that it is a good public space and it's um, heavily used in the summertime. That's when we want to be constructing because the water levels are low um, to meet fisheries requirements, et cetera. But we have a very narrow window. And typically, um, that's we wait till after Labor Day. So it doesn't give us a lot of time before the first rains hit. So um, we were planning to install that additional log boom in the middle colliery dam. 
Um, it was just, we just ran out of time. And um, public, involving the public is something we need to do more of. Uh, certainly that's something we can always improve on. We're working with uh, Charlotte's group and ourselves and meeting on a regular basis to, to extend the outreach to some of these um, deficiencies that we need to address and give them better understanding. And with that, I'll hand it over to Mr. Bonin to talk more of the technical requirements. Sure. Yeah, so um, I've been in this industry for about 27 years and most of it's been working in dam safety and public safety around dams. And honestly, um, the public safety around dams really became to the forefront in the early 2000s when the Canadian Dam Association came out with some guidelines regarding how to assess those and how to address that. And really what that is about is, um, is again, um, people being unaware of hazards around dams and getting themselves into bad locations and trying to address that. Um, that was spurred on by some really high profile fatalities that occurred um, both in, in Ontario and a few in British Columbia also and fairly recently. And so um, fortunately, I mean, I, I got involved pretty early on and helped with some of these guidelines and I've been teaching workshops and the like on how to deal with them. So this is an offshoot of dam safety. Dam safety looks at failure of dams and losing containment of structures, but public safety is more um, the day-to-day -day operation. How do we guide the use of our dams safely? We know that people use our dams, people recreate near them, but they're also not really aware of a lot of the hazards that they may be facing, and that's a big problem. So what, is the, what are the types of regulations we have to deal with? Well, BC Dam Safety Regulation isn't explicit in this, and they're about to get very serious about it. This is something I know in discussing with the regulator, they're very serious about, and they do have some provisions in there, and there might be some additional guidance documents they're putting together. But basically, the basic uh, statement is the city is obligated to protect public safety around its dams. Um, there's another thing is that Transport Canada and all of these waterways are actually navigable. Um, they, they will generally, if you have to go for a, an approval from them, they will make you put a boom in front of all your spillways. Um, that's true across Canada. And then how do you deal with all of this? The Canadian Dam Association put together a pretty, pretty good guideline on how to assess and mitigate these types of risks. Um, as Mike said, there's also the Municipal Insurance Association of BC that conducts safety audits. So what have you guys been doing to date? Um, like Mike alluded to, you've been catching up on a lot of long-term deficiencies, um, put, installing some fencing, some signage, and some spillway booms. Some of the challenges here are that we have a developed public usage patterns at all of these facilities. And there's a heavy resistance to changing those patterns, and that's understandable. People have been there for a lot of long time. But there's also the liability faced by the city itself by allowing people to go there. So how do we balance that? And as Mike also said, is that especially out here, some of your recreational dams are heavily used, so actually doing any sort of construction, whether it be dam safety maintenance or public safety works, you don't have a very big period where there aren't people there and your weather is good enough to actually do some of the work. So those are some of the challenges that are faced. Uh, so as we alluded to here, the, keep, the public safety allowance is to keep the public from interacting with serious hazards at the dam through reasonable control measures. And the word reasonable is something that we use quite often because you can get out of hand on these things fairly simply. Uh, compared to dam, dam safety, um, we've, we don't have a central, uh, central area where we track public safety incidents, um, but we do collect news records as part of the Canadian Dam Association. And we've documented in Canada over 300 fatalities associated with public safety incidents at dams in Canada. Uh, contrast that to dam safety where there's been 11 fatalities over the last 100 years or so. So we're, this deserves some serious consideration. Of these fatalities, 105 of them happened in the last, in the last 20 years. Um, and that doesn't include the ones that are underreported. A lot of them don't ever make it into the newspapers. Um, another illustration is uh, during a three-week period in 2013, 
Uh, in North America, that includes the US, there's 40 reported public safety incidents at dams. Four of these were in Canada. 24 fatalities occurred and 16 additional people were hospitalized due to major or severe near, uh, injuries or near drownings. And one of the biggest problems is like, um, is about 11 of these were rescued with EMS. And especially um, in the States and Canada, a lot of these rescues are high risk. So we're losing a lot of EMTs and that in, in, in trying to save people from getting mostly into spillways. So that, that's sort of a, a primer on public safety around dams and what's coming. Um, let's, let's talk now about dam safety in general. Before we can talk about dam safety, we have to, what is a dam? Well, a dam is a man-made structure intended to retain water. It's fairly obvious. But um, if you think about it a little bit. Hello? Well, yes, it is. Oh, am I going? No, sorry. So, I think you're okay to go. I think they got so, it. Sorry. Um, so anyway, if you think of it this way, what, what we're doing is we're up in the watershed and we're retaining energy. I mean, that's why we, uh, why we build hydropower dams. That water is a pile of mass that's sitting there and it's stored energy. It's a battery. And so if you think of it that way, really what we are, if this gets released quickly, we're releasing all that energy all at once. So it can be really devastating. So what, what is dam safety about then? Well, it's the managing of, of those risks that the dam poses to the public, infrastructure, and the environment, mostly on the downstream side of these things. So what is a dam safety incident? Really, dam safety is focused on one thing, the loss of that retention of water. Uh, the sudden failure of the dam resulting in the rapid release of all that stored water or energy. And what are we looking at there? Well, the consequences of one of these failures are fairly, like I said, they're fairly obvious, but the biggest one we concern about is the potential for loss of life. That's not the only thing. Economic losses are huge on these things in general, um, in terms of houses get washed away, businesses, um, infrastructure losses, bridges, um, um, water mains, things like that. Then there's also environmental losses. Remember, we're releasing all this water all at once. So we're scouring the heck out of the floodplain in a, in a very short period of time. This is, dam fails is like the worst, the, the worst flood you've ever experienced. And then there's the cultural losses. Again, um, there's potentially there's burial grounds downstream. There's important cultural historical sites that get washed away and these can't be replaced. So we consider all of these and when we classify these dams and determine their risk. So why do they fail? Um, there, there's basically four main types of failure. One is overtopping, and that means that the water upstream rises and goes over the top of the dam. Most of these dams are made out of earth, and it doesn't take a lot of overtopping for that to fail the dam completely. So, really, that's a function of your spillway and how big it is, and whether it's big enough to handle what we call a design event that's based upon the classification. That's a fairly straightforward one, but there's a couple that aren't so straightforward. There's internal erosion, something we call piping. All dams leak a little bit. Well, what can happen is if there's weaknesses in the dam itself, if it's old enough and hasn't been maintained, you can get these, th that, those leaks can get worse and worse and start bringing material out. Eventually what happens um, is that you form what we call a pipe, which is exactly what it sounds like, a big void in there, and the dam collapses and gets washed away. Related to that is foundation problems, which is similar to what I just described, except instead of going through the dam, the, the foundation leaks and starts to leak worse and worse and worse. And then that collapses and either your concrete dam can flop over or your embankment dam can collapse internally and erode away. The other parts, uh, the other potential issues are gate failure and operator error. And the city is actually in pretty good shape there is that they don't have, you don't have a lot of gates and operations that you need to take care of that could result in dam failure. So how do, the, we, how do these failure modes lead to dam failure? Well, there's about basically four other, th four things that you have to worry about. There's improper design, poor standards when they were built. Remember, the, a lot of these dams were built a long time ago before there were standards. Um, improper construction methods. A lot of times these dams that were built quite a long time ago um, we're just built with whatever was lying around. 
Um, then there's unexpected conditions. Again, you don't have enough capacity for a, to handle a major storm event that will, will cause an overtopping event. Climate change runs into that. And the last one is the one that often gets overlooked because dams seem like they're forever. Um, you put them up and they just sit there. But lack of maintenance, inspection, and surveillance. Um, some of you may be, uh, may be aware of the, uh, of the Oroville uh, dam almost failure that happened in California. And a lot of that was um, they just normalized a problem and just overlooked it year after year after year, and never addressed it. So. So let's talk a little bit about dam safety in Canada. Canada as a country has an exceptional record of dam safety. We've had very few failures resulting in loss of life. But there are five recorded failures that we're aware of that lost in 11 lives lost in Canada. And every time one of those happens, it's a major issue. The one in Quebec, which I believe uh, killed five people, resulted in a long-term um, set of guidance and regulations and legislation that they're following to this day. Uh, and that was in the 60s that that occurred. But dams do fail, and they can fail. And a couple of the most prominent ones I can name are actually happened in this province. Um, Testa Linden Dam failed in 2010. It's a very small structure, very small reservoir. The pictures on the right that I'm showing here um, show the kind of devastation that happens downstream. Nobody was injured, but it, that was pretty lucky. The other one I think everybody's also, uh, also familiar with is Mount Pauly, which was a tailing structure. And that was due to a lot of things, but improper construction, improper operation maintenance was the, the big ones there. So those are two big ones, but there have been more. So let's talk about British Columbia specifically. Um, British Columbia is interesting. It has 1,500 active water dams. That's basically the most of any province. Why? And, and we have a very diver, diverse set of dam owners. Most provinces have a couple. Um, we have every city almost in the province has a couple of dams. Um, basically, there are 11 known recent dam failures, half of which occurred since 1995. And honestly, BC has had dam safety regulations since 2000. And they were one of the first adopters because they have so many structures. Um, then what happened was the failure of Testa Linden and Mount Pauly and actually several other smaller dams you probably aren't aware of prompted the review and revamp of the dam safety regulations in 2016. And a lot of what we're doing right now is in response to those changes. Um, some of the other issues in British Columbia is many small dams in BC, of the smaller dams in BC are old. Many are over 100 years. Um, what I deal with a lot in this province is that there are questionable design and construction and foundation conditions we don't actually know what a lot of dams are built out of. And that causes a lot of problems for me as an engineer and a lot of investigations. Um, a lot of them have never been maintained. And again, that scares me because again, you, you need to be at least observing them and maintaining them periodically. They need, like anything, they will technically last forever with proper maintenance. And I've, in, my, uh, in my home province of Manitoba, we have a number of examples where they didn't maintain it's very expensive dams that were built in the 70s, and now they can't maintain them anymore. They have to replace them. And that's hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. So maintenance is important. And the other big one that we're facing, especially in BC, is that they originally built and there's no people around. And now, because <laughs> probably because the dams are there in the first place, there's lots of people around. So there's a lot more people downstream of these dams that can be, that can be affected by them if they were to break. So what are the industry standards? Really, the big one in Canada is the Canadian Dam Association guidelines. Um, a lot of provinces don't have regulation, but really the Canadian law talks about, uh, if you get, talks about industry standards, and that's the de facto industry standard in Canada. It's also used by a pile of other countries around the world. It's like the poster child of uh, guidelines for dam safety. Um, even the U.S. adopts a lot of stuff from this. I'm on a few of those uh, committees. BC Dam Safety Regulation was first, again, enacted in 2000, revised in 2016. But the interesting thing about that is it broadly references the CDA and conforms to the CDA. It, it leans on those guidelines very hard. So the 2016 regulation, what does it say? And the most important thing, I think, for this group is that is this one statement. 
Dam owners may be held liable for any damage and loss caused by the negligent construction, operation, or failure of a dam. That's a really powerful statement, and even without a regulation, it is still true. What is it saying, though? If the dam fails in any manner that you could have foreseen, detected, or prevented, you're most likely to be held responsible for any and all damages, meaning loss of life, economics, all of that. And that's been demonstrated in Canada a few places. Um, but, one of the, but there's a good thing here is that following your regulation and the CDA guidelines helps to, to mitigate that risk. Certainly, it, it provides you the framework that you can go, or go through and doing the re prove that you're doing the right things. And uh, fortunately, um, I think the city of Nanaimo overall is doing a reasonably good job of this, which is, I'm always happy to see. And I've been working with these guys for quite a while, though. And they've always impressed me with that. So dam classifications, what do these things mean? Again, we've, we, as Mike said, we have five categories that we talk about, low to extreme. How do we define those? Basically, what they're defined is what would happen if your dam would fail. It's not talking about the condition of your dam or how likely they are to fail. It's what would happen if they were to fail for any reason. And um, that really governs the risk that, that the dam poses and the, and the guidance you have to follow. And really, I mean, this is a big tale. You don't have to read all of it. The, the, the big thing is that they, they really concentrate on the only part that they really put real numbers in is the potential for loss of life. And we can go through what that means and how we assess that. It's neither here nor there. But for you guys, it's like a high is 10 or a few p potential people would be killed if the dam failed. Very high is 100 to 10 to 100. And an extreme is anything more than 100 people. So they're, they're, it's an interesting way to assess dams. And it's, that's sort of the, what we consider to be the most important although we do consider infrastructure and economics, environmental and cultural values. But really, I mean, I, mean, I think it's all our priority is loss of life is, is huge for us as, as, a, as a group. So what does this do for you guys? I mean, this, in this chart here, basically means that you have to do a certain th number of things every year um, or every twice a year or weekly. Um, how often you have to go out and look at your dam, what those, look, what those inspections look like, um, how often you have to test them, and how often you have to collect you know, instrumentation readings to see if there's piping going on, things like that. But the big one I think right now is that about every seven to 10 years, depending on the classification, you have to go in and do a formal dam safety review. And also you upgrade your OMS, operation maintenance and surveillance, and your emergency planning uh, documents. As far as the formal dam safety review is, is we go in and we take a look can the dam meet current guidelines? Is, it, is that a problem um, if they can't? And what we can do to fix that? So um, we, we go and we figure out what you call deficiencies and address them over time. Uh, no dam is perfect. There's always a few deficiencies that lag around there, but it's really the ones that are gonna lead to failure that we worry the most about. Um, so what's the city's uh, three-year plan? Well, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, a number of your dams are due for their, annu for their 10 year uh, dam safety review uh, update. So right now, my group is working to update the middle colliery dam. We've performed a hydrology analysis, a dam safety review is coming. And this, uh, from that, we know we're gonna have to do a seismic analysis because earthquake um, standards have changed. But also, I mean, Jump Creek is another one that uh, there, we have to do a DSR on, or the city does anyway. South Fork, we know we have to do a seismic analysis. Westwood Lake also needs a, a dam safety review done. And then the other ones will follow in the next few years. So we try and space these out so you're not doing them all in one time. You have 10 dams, so doing them all in one year doesn't make a lot of sense. But uh, you guys have a pretty good forward-looking plan on this, and, some, and, and so you're anticipating what you need to do and for planning for it, which is what we always like to see. So what are we doing right now? Well, Middle Colliery Dam is, in its, is the first one in the group that has, is on its 10-year cycle. So we're currently, I'm finishing up a reclassification of the structure, which is something that's been a bit of a challenge for many years, and uh, I'm reviewing the report right now. 
and some good news and bad news but uh, on that, but it will be completed very shortly. The dam safety review follows closely after that, and, the, and then the, uh, after that we go into the seismic analysis. Each one of these chains into the other because the results feed into each other. Also, there's a DSR that has to happen for the low, lower Colliery Dam, Jump Creek, South Fork, and Westwood, so about half. And then there's a couple of seismic analyses. Again, we are ma majorly concerned about that middle Colliery Dam because it has been found to be susceptible to a seismic and has been uh, out of compliance with the regulation for a while. And South Fork um, is actually um, also um, one that we know is extremely vulnerable and uh, that, that's gonna be ev evaluated in this year. So let's talk a little bit about the Middle Call Area Dam. And again, I'm sorry my pronunciation on that. W what is the importance of this dam? Honestly, I mean, as a dam safety engineer and a dam engineer, I, I really like this dam, um, even from an aesthetic point of view. And it's got a lot of history. So it's actually a really important recreational, historical, cultural, and natural space for the city. It's quite well used. It's a really neat space. I really like it. Um, what, but there are some challenges. Um, we need to perform some maintenance to preserve the dam. You can see in the picture on the right, the concrete is in really bad shape. Um, being underneath that bridge there, I've been done the inspection under there, there's concrete falling on you, exposed rebar, all those great things. And we need to do some of this re restoration slash maintenance work um, with also respecting the public users' wants and needs because we do understand that this is, th this is an important space and frankly, I do want to preserve it for future generations because it is a big part of your history. We also know that there's a strong community desire to preserve these types of spaces, including the lower colliery also. But, but there are some realities we have to face. The regulations have changed since 2016. The seismic assessments have changed. The tools have improved markedly. Um, and we're gonna need to look at the dam's current state. We might need to do some investigations. But really, I mean, it's pretty obvious that the dam itself, uh, the concrete side of it is in that state of deterioration. We also know that the spillway is undersized. It's been that way for a while. And unfortunately, the regula regulator also knows this and has really been pushing us really hard to try and address these uh, issues for a number of years. And we've been uh, working on that also. So what are our steps moving forward? Really, we need to address the major issues as per the provincial order to bring it back into compliance. This, until recently, was identified as the most risky dam in the province. By the, and we, fortunately, some of the work we did got it downgraded a little bit, but uh, it's still not technically in compliance. But we also want to preserve the dam and the space for the public. We want the, we want the public to be able to use this in a safe manner. So what are we doing? We're completing a pretty serious hydrology analysis, something that's been back and forth over a number of years, the dam classification, geotechnical and seismic analysis, and then a full dam safety review, and that is actually gonna be a reported to council in the fall after we've completed that. And uh, again, at that point, we're gonna have a, a, a detailed path forward of what really needs to be done. And uh, fortunately, um, my, my structural engineer who works on my team is, is pretty, uh, is pretty optimistic about being able to, to save most of the dam and just do uh, a lot of uh, repairs to it and basically hopefully keep it from looking much different than it is right now. And there's a number of ways we can do that, but we're looking into that. So I think that's pretty much my presentation. Uh, thank you. Any questions from council? Uh, Councilor Perino? Uh, thank you so much. The presentation is excellent. I just, do you have any idea about the costs of what uh, this dam would, would take to, um, to do the repair to get it back to where? That's a really good question. We do not at, at this point because it really depends. The concrete repairs aren't technically very difficult. Okay. It's what we have to do with the spillway, whether we have to make it a little wider or we have to build the dam up a little bit to give it more capacity. Okay. Um, and we haven't decided which one is better, and it'll also depend on the size. My, my sincere hope on this is actually that we can do most of the work uh, uh, as far as stability and seismic 
on the downstream side near the toe. That's usually where we try to work. Okay. And so hopefully it won't have a huge impact on the overall look of everything. So we might have some cost estimates by the fall, is that what you're thinking? You will, absolutely okay. you will. Thank you. We'll have budgetary cost estimates by then. Okay. I don't, I hesitate to even guess at this point. No, it's okay, it's, uh, I appreciate the, the thought, thank you. Okay. I have uh, Mayor Krogh. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and, and thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, just a couple of questions. The, the test of Linden failure, was that the one near Oliver on the uh, Golden Mile? Yeah. Okay. Um, and the second question, and just so I'm clear, in terms of the, the Colliery Dam, Middle Colliery Dam as it stands now, we have not addressed the issues with the province. Fair well, to say, and and what what's what's the next step if we don't address it within a reasonable period of time? Well, we, the really what they're looking for is what we're doing right now, and I've had these discussions with the with the regulator, uh, so is Bill and, and company. We've um, the first step is to define the problem as it always is. So, one of the problems is is that we've been guessing at it, or they've been guessing at it a little bit. So. The first step is the stem classification, which I'm looking at right now. And again, there's some good news there. We're not necessarily where we thought we would be. We're in a lower bracket in terms of classification than we thought, which is good. But also understanding what the seismic, you know, the seismic is and um, what, the, what, what needs to happen in order to address those are the next big things. The province understands this. Um, they're willing, as long as we have a plan to address them in a reasonable amount of time, they're gonna be uh, very amenable to that. They don't really want to get involved unless they have to. Mr. Sims. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me, thanks, Chair. And just so Council's aware, we are subject to an open order on the part of the provincial government. So they've written us an order on this dam and the work that Mr. Bonin's company is doing is is in fulfillment of that order, but it's they're, they're watching it fairly closely and, and very yeah. seriously. Thank you. Follow up, Mayor. Thank you, that's good. Councillor Eastmere. Um, thank you, through you. My question is about um, the safety signage and whether uh, more signage is required or if some of the signage we have is, is outdated at this point. Um, well, the big, the, as far as the province is concerned, the big safety signage are these ones that say, if you see a dam safety incident, call this number. I believe those are all in place right now. Um, as far as safety signage goes, um, and again, I've done about 100 different dams in terms of public safety. Um, more is not better in these cases. You want directed, effective signage is what I call it, to call it, where I have a photo of one of BC Hydro sites that has 75 signs in a single photograph, and nobody's reading those. So the whole idea is that we do the minimum possible that's going to accomplish what you want. And so I, I'm not a big fan of putting big fences all over the place and, and whatever, but we need to have it directed and focused. And so there's probably some public safety signage that would need to happen. It doesn't have to be too obtrusive. It doesn't have to be like big signs. The, on, Ontario Power Generation has signs that are, you can almost see from space. Mm -hmm. And they, for very good reason, because they had some major issues. But in general, that's not something we, that's not where we want to be. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I think I'm recalling the like tsunami warning signs that, that went up and there's some like muster points and some of them are in areas where it's, it's sort of alarming to see and it's, it's disconnected from the dam itself and you kind of just see this like tsunami muster yeah. point sign uh, and it, it doesn't. There, it doesn't there's also a strategy to that too and I'm not saying anything about the tsunami but for as public safety goes, what we don't do is we don't put prohibitions in. Um, as, a, as a group in the Canadian Dam Association, which I'm not, I'm, I have two hats. I'm a part of that group also. But what we do is we have, again, you have a sign that says danger, if it's a danger or warning, and then a, uh, what, is, what, it, what is the issue? And then what should you do about it? So danger, strong currents and undertow, keep away. Things like that, very simple messages, pictographs for people that don't read English, it's really important that we capture those people because a lot of people don't aren't necessarily literate in English. They might be literate in their own language, but a lot of people are here who speak different languages right now. And it's a big problem in in most of the provinces. So, thank you, thank you, Councillor Hammonds. 
Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for the presentation, very informative. Um, I'm looking at the slide, why dams fail, and I'm noting 38% overtopping gate fails to open, and there's also a 6% section around gate failure. Are those mechanical failures, or is that human error? Um, it, well, the 6% the the is human error. It wasn't open because it, because we didn't recognize, and I had a, I, I investigated a dam failure about three years ago where they never even bothered to try and open the dam and the dam failed. That was in Manitoba. Um, the, the ones where it says gate fails is normally a bearing in one of the gates, in one of the uh, attainer gates fails or some mechanical failure happens. The thing breaks, essentially. That's part of the overtopping. If you have enough spill capacity, something jams, you can't open it for whatever reason. That's captured there. Um, that it also captures whether you have a spillway that's way too small. That's the other part of that. So forgive my ignorance on this. The, yeah. the, who is responsible for opening the gate when we know the water pressure is more than we can, than it's safe? Um, the dam owner always. And is, is, that, uh, is that, forgive me, is this someone who works in an organization yep. who lifts the gate? Yep, but well. like I would say, you have very few gates. Most of these structures have what they call a fixed crest weir, meaning there's nothing to operate. As long as it doesn't plug with debris, which is a possibility, you don't have to do anything. They're, they're, uh, they're self-regulating. The, the only one that isn't is, is jump, which again, I, I think these guys have an extremely good handle on. They're out there every day. And that's less to do with flooding and more to do with releasing water for the city's consumption, because it's way up at the very top of the reservoir. So the chances of an overtopping thing like that are pretty small. Thank you. Thank you. And I have two questions. Uh, first one will probably go to Mr. Sims. Um, are we starting to budget for this, like in reserves, putting money in reserves? And secondly, are there any grants available for this type of work? Thanks. Good, good question, Chair. I, I, I doubt that there um, would be any grants available. Last question first. Just this is purely... Um, a consequence of owning dams. It's just like any infrastructure we own, uh, other than say something like community works funding. Um, but specific to um, maintaining our dams, there's rarely have I seen the federal or provincial governments come out with grant funding. Um, and then the other part the, about budgeting at this point, not because we don't we don't know what the cost will be and the timing for those costs. Other than, as uh, Mr. Squire indicated, with for South Fork Dam, that uh, seismic study is planned for this year, and then we're looking, you know, we've got an notional uh, number, I believe it's 2031, which will be the centenary of that dam. So those are, those are being budgeted at this point. Okay, and then my um, second question is, is um, you know, we, we know this is, was concerning some years ago, is there going to be, if, if we start doing work and stuff, a, a communi communication plan engaged so that the public knows exactly what's happening and the rationale as to why? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. And, and part of the rationale today is to introduce the whole topic, not only to, uh, to council, but also the public. And just to, this is a refresher. We're, we're back again, you know, and certainly uh, previous efforts were concerning for the public and, and, uh, and we acknowledge that. And so certainly trying to bring this along on a, on a graduated or what's the right word I'm looking for, just a managed, managed basis for sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, seeing no further questions, thank you so much. And we're go going now to Mr. Sullivan. And you have five minutes. All right, are we ready? Um, yes, we go. I am. And thank you for a lot in the time, I appreciate it. Um, all of our parts um, help make our community desirable. Um, but of course, I'm here to talk about cholera and special significance. It's, um, the picture isn't full there. Whoops, sorry. Uh, uh, is that okay? Wendy. Um, that's a, that's a, a heritage picture. And, and Pete um, Mafia was the mayor at the time. And uh, I think it gives a, a, an example of the kind of history that uh, Colliery has in our community. Um, he mentioned it was, uh, must be extremely proud of the heritage um, of the uh, Harewood community. It's one of the finest parks and swimming spots on Vancouver Island. And the photo gives a, 
uh, semblance of how popular it was. And just an aside, there's, you could see all the people on the side sitting or playing, and uh, and a lot of people playing in the spillway, and because there's little or no there's there's little or no flow uh, during the recreational periods. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to uh, let's see here. Hang on, how do we do that? Okay. So the uh, the park has been under duress for uh, quite a period of time. And um, there have been some major changes and, uh, it, that have impacted the park. Uh, you can see the, um, uh, the pipeline that went through the middle there a number of years ago. And of course, the, um, the city reservoir was parked uh, on, and took out a whole chunk of the, uh, of the park. Uh, these were major developments. So they, um, that, that in, ended up, uh, we lost about 150 trees in a whole corner of the park. Um, can you do the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the video? Would that be okay? Sorry. Thank you. So here's a little picture of the video of, uh, of a little um, of the lower colliery dam. It's very short, but it's um, it gives a sense of, of what the what the park and um, what the lower part uh, colliery dam look like. Uh, it doesn't look like that right now, um, but anyway, it does it does give an example of how beautiful it was. Thank you so much. That's great. I really appreciate it. Um, so the uh, whoops. Okay, so this is what we got when it was cut, uh, when we got the auxiliary spillway, and um, uh, it not only created a tremendous eyesore, um, but it also created a serious hazard. And uh, when I talk about that, um, there was uh, because you've all seen the video of the kids walking along those little labyrinth walls, ten foot down to concrete on one side, jumping into the water on the other side. Um, so security was posted on the side there to keep people from going around um, or to keep the kids away. But I have to say, um, there were some positive uh, steps taken after that and um, a little rebuilding of trust as we went along. The landscaping uh, was placed and the boom was removed from, the, uh, from uh, covering both the spillways. And both offered deterrence and softened the, the area. Uh, somewhat around uh, this major construction project. Uh, the tech uh, positive technical information was also coming forward that began filtering that uh, seemed to bode well for the middle dam, which has been talked about at serious length here. Um, so it was disheartening, I'd have to say, um, that uh, the boom was moved back to, uh, to cover both of the dams, and this is this is a picture not now, but this was a picture in 2016. And that's why it was moved from that particular location at that time, because it made such a tremendous mess. And also, it was impossible for the uh, staff to maintain and keep it, keep it uh, clear. Um, so that was a bit of a drag. And um, I think that some of the trust between that and um, moving it away from the um, uh, auxiliary spillway those were two safety factors that I thought actually were in place that actually helped us out a little bit. Um, so um, the, when I talk about the, the boom at the lower, because that's the one that's here in place right now, it, it, when I talk about the issues, it will be the same issues at the middle if we have a boom there, except probably worse. Um, this, is, uh, this is what the boom looks like right now. I mean, it changes a little bit, but it just accumulates all the debris, doesn't get cleaned, all the stuff that happens there. And uh, you can see how it fouls the lake and uh, continually around, and a lot of this stuff will just end up down at the bottom or preventing some of the recreational value of the lake from occurring. Um, so I am saying that we can do better. And um, instead of just reverting to whoops to a, a previous uh, problematic plan and just replacing the boom where it was and fouling the lake and making a huge mess, I think we can do better. I think there's very much, there's many, numerous options that are we can we can explore. So the, here's a picture of um, Harewood, um, excuse me, on Harewood Mines Road. This is from the subdivision that's right in front uh, there. It's being built. As you know, tremendous amount of development on the south end, all of Nanaimo, of course. South of Nanaimo, incredible uh, development. This is on Harewood Mines Road, and this is a picture of our lower lake. It's a big attraction. People come and live there for a certain reason. They, they want accessibility to some beautiful, a beautiful park and some surrounding area. Um, it's not just 
uh, there. Uh, Sunim was going to develop the land uh, right on the other side, on, on the Nanaimo Lakes Road. We have the, King, the old King Arthur Courts. We have Watfield. We have a lot of people. And they depend on this resource, this, this, this tremendous park, as a, as a place to come to. I'm not even talking about the university and the international. This is a good first look for people. Very, very important. Um, and if it's a mess, and they walk in and they say a huge mess, it's a really bad look. Um, so in summary, and I have 10 seconds, summary, I, I know what you're thinking. It's out of our hands and government mandates in place. Further work is being suggested. We've got to, but what I'm saying is requires very, very careful scrutiny. And you have to weigh the benefits and drawbacks as, as some information can be very misleading or incorrect. And I think I pretty much made it. Yep. Sorry. Thank you. Just a few seconds later. And I'm very open to questions if anybody has any. Thank you. Any, count, any questions? Uh, start with the mayor, then we'll go to Ben and then Hillary. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Solomon. Uh, Mr. Solomon, most delegations usually have some very fairly specific ask at the end of it, and I'm not sure I heard an ask in your presentation. What, what's, what's your ask of council in, 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 in with respect okay. to this? Is it, is it largely around the aesthetic of the, of the boom and, and the debris gathering? Is it, well, well I, I certainly think that there's many different options about the boom. That's right in our face right now, and it's contaminating the lake and making a huge mess. So that's right there. But I think, but I think that there's going to be, I'm assuming now, that there is uh, work to be uh, considered or strongly considered and possibly uh, implemented at the middle Colliery Dam. And of course, there's information now that what I had, very positive information previously, um, that would lead to an alternate conclusion about what may be required. So I think we need to look at that information very, very carefully. And obviously, I would like to see the studies that are gonna come forward. Um, but I think that the council needs to really consider that and not take verbatim in terms of exactly what is handed to you because every, everything that might be considered um, will have a tremendous impact and tremendous cost. And we need to only do what we need is absolutely required to maintain this facility. And, and just so I'm clear, if I may, uh, when you, you mentioned alternate information, uh, so is that alternate information engineering studies or, or, or what's, what, are you, what are you driving at when you use that term? Uh, because no. I'm very concerned that if an engineer tells me that the dam isn't safe and this has to be done, I'm yeah. no offense going to rely on that. Yeah, totally. I understand that totally. And I, I think that um, I, I guess I'm a little more fortunate than some others because I was able to be on the technical committee for a number of years and I did sit with the engineers and I did sit with the dam safety branch as well as staff. So I perhaps have a little bit more insight into what went on. And um, one of the reasons we ended up with what I consider to be a major um, overkill with the auxiliary spillway was because of a recommendation from Golder that they said that if we do something here, we don't have to do anything at the middle dam. Now that, there may be other thoughts about that, but that's, that was the indication. So that's what we ended up with. But I, in terms of, uh, I had some reasonably good communication up until um, uh, the last year with your city staff and um, the, there were two hydrology reports that were, that were implemented, and um, both by urban systems, and they became, and the, the numbers that they were coming with fell well within the range of what may be required in terms of the spillway being considered as being under capacity. And I, I think that that seemed to be really, really positive. The other thing too is that of course when Golder um, they looked at the seismic. They needed to look at that because that was the biggest concern initially with respect to the colliery dams, that they would fall down, that they would um, uh, create a massive wave that could wipe out half of Harrowit, and uh, up to 150 people could be you know, uh, killed. Well, that's, that's a pretty serious concern. And that was from engineers. So that's what I'm saying is that these were reports from engineers that needed to be looked at a little more closely in terms of really, was that possible? Is that really going to happen? 
obviously that's a scary, scary scenario. So they, but Golder also said that um, they, were, they dismiss the idea of this. I mean, it's, it's on the record now that they, they want to do some work in terms of seismic, um, you know, capacity of the lower dam. It has so little, they, they never felt that it had any significance anyway, the middle dam. And that's why we got this huge thing at the lower one. But the seismic, if you try to, I don't know if, if, if uh, the fellow, Mr. H uh, Hatch, if Hatch is uh, considering coring the dam, it's only a two foot wall. You don't, you don't drill that dam because it isn't as substantial as the lower one. I don't know what, what's required in that way. But I, I think that those, those things have to be considered very, very carefully. Even the assessment of the dam and then the recommendations that were put forward after. I don't know if I answered your question. I'm sorry if I didn't. <laughs> well, it was certainly a very long answer in any way. Well, event. I Thank guess you. so. <laughs> Councillor Gieselbrock. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, through you uh, to Mr. Solomon. Uh, so just with the, the boom on the lower dam, uh, are, are you, like specifically with that situation, uh, are you looking for alternatives to how the boom is being deployed and when? And uh, I'm just not clear on um, sort of the, the ask on that, that end. Okay. Well, first of all, I think the, the, the first ask would be don't, don't do something that has already turned you're doing exactly what you did in 2016 that created a huge mess and it was really problematic for the community and for staff to maintain. So don't do exactly the same thing. But in terms of doing something different, uh, yes, I would be asking for that because I think there's alternatives that can be, that, that would serve, serve the safety issue better as well as making the aesthetics of the, of the lake better. And I, I don't think that they're, this is not rocket science or whatever, but, uh, you know, I think that there can be something implemented that would uh, be less um, intrusive. Okay, thank you. I, I've got a follow-up question to staff. Uh, but um, we'll, wait, we'll wait for staff till after the delegation. Thank you. Thanks. Councillor Eastmere. Uh, th thank you. Yeah, through you, I think my question was along the same lines of your the issues that you're having with the boom, but um, earlier you said uh, the boom is contaminating the lake, and I feel like that's not a helpful narrative to perpetuate unless you can tell me a bit more about how you think it's contaminating the lake beyond the um, material that it's accumulating, like sticks and leaves, which would otherwise be going over the spillway. Okay, well, it collects absolutely everything that's on the surface, right? And so when I, it, it, it doesn't make, when I say contaminate, I guess I should, it's not like you, you're drinking it and you're, you're drinking dirty water or you're swimming in this dirty water. It's just that it's a mess and, it, and it's, when I, I'm using that word perhaps inappropriately, but it is, um, to me, when I go, when, I, when we go to the, to the park and we go there a lot, I mean, basically, we're picking up stuff all the time because we don't want debris and dirt and, and, and refuge. So we're picking it up all the time. Well, now I feel like we should be picking up and trying to clean the lake on a daily basis. We never had to do that before. It does it to itself naturally. It's much more enticing to use the to use the lake and to observe the lake if it doesn't have a big mess on it. Uh, I mean. Um, we, we supported these Moby mats, you know, so people could have access to the lake. But if it's a real mess and it's not enticing, then why, why would you want to go and swim in it, you know? Or... Yeah, I think what I've personally observed is um, the boom placement is quite close to the stairs access on that one bank. So I think people are used to being able to... Um, walk in and, and swim to the little platform there. But around the corner, you're talking about the Moby mats that are on the beach. Um, mm -hmm. Is the, the boom causing uh, more material to accumulate in that area? Because my observation is that the, yeah. most of the material is on the one side close to the stairs. 
Yeah, I mean, the flow will always come back to the spillway. That's what the design, right? It comes mm -hmm. back to the original spillway. That's where the water goes. So it, it, would, it would always come that way. Um, so you're right. I mean, and around the, the, the kids' beach, it won't be as, look as messy as some of the other areas. But if you look along the perimeter wall, even to the other swimming area, it's, it's, it, the stuff is sitting there. You see, the, you see, the, you see, the, you just have to look down. You just have to walk along the wall and just look down. You just see the big mess it, or it's, or it's already, it's already accumulating at the base of the wall. I mean, it's, it's going to have to happen because it just doesn't go anywhere. Um, and what would your recommendation be as far as um, public engagement if there is more work required at the dam? Like, how, how do you think that public engagement should be done? Because we did have the technical working group, but that was sort of a small number of people. Like, what, what is an effective strategy in your mind? Well, I mean, if, you, if your staff was open to it, absolutely. I mean, a, a small working group in terms of community members, um, I mean, I'd love to be a part of that. Um, obviously, we need to get the word out uh, in terms of every way possible, and the city has their means. And of course, we have, you know, we talk to people all the time, you know, through the community. We go to the park all the time. And, of, and uh, we, you know, we have the Facebook site, and that's the kind of stuff that the word spreads a bit. So, I mean, I think there's ways of doing that to let people know what's going on because if you surprise people, uh, you just get a little bit more backlash. I mean, if we had had the opportunity to have some discussion before these recent changes had, had occurred, I think we may have been able to come to an alternate plan that might have been um, just more appropriate. Um, but I mean, I, I actually consider it pretty much criminal that those all the the landscaping was removed around that perimeter wall. I couldn't believe that you would ask for that to be done. And I, it was shocking, actually. I mean, it was, it was planted with good intention, and it, was, and it started to beautify the area as much as you can around a construction site. And then it was, half of it was ripped out. I, I, I just, it's, it's, it's not, that doesn't make us feel like we have really, you know, really great intentions happening here. I, I appreciate your, your comment on that. I'll just say, like, I have seen a lot of emails go back and forth with staff around that the vegetation that was removed. And my understanding is it has to do with protecting the structural integrity of, of the wall with the roots of the, the vegetation. And I don't think there was any direct ask from council to do that. We're just sort of following the direct um, direction we're getting from, from dam safety. So it's, I, I feel... Like I feel the frustration and the public perception on these things, but a lot of it isn't. It's not a choice for us. It's regulations that we're following. But I think there is definitely going to be opportunities for more public engagement and like bringing people along on this journey as we figure out next steps for safety with the park, which is such a, a valuable and, and loved community asset. So appreciate all your advocacy on this. Thank you so much, Councillor Perino. Thank you, Chair. Actually, I have a question for staff. Okay, you'll wait, Councillor Hammonds. Okay, push your buttons again, please. Anybody else, question for Mr. Solomon? Seeing none, thank you very much. Yep, thank you. Staff questions, and I'll start with Councillor Gesselbrecht, because I know we had one. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair, through you, um, to staff. Uh, my question is just on the boom. Um, I haven't been observing the boom too closely. Uh, I, you know, I, I go swim at the Colliery Dam pretty regularly in the summer, um, and uh, haven't really noticed the boom. Um, but I just I went up there this weekend and had a look, and of course I could see the boom. And yeah, there's like a bunch of material collected, kind of right where the um, entrance to go swimming is. And I, I mean, there's not a lot of people swimming at the moment, but there people do go in the water there. Um, and it is pretty gross. Uh, and so my question is, is like, do flows totally stop in, I, I can't, I can't remember if the, if the dam goes below the spillway, so there's not really any flow anyhow in the summer over the spillway. So there's not anything accumulated, but what options do we have in terms of adjusting how that, uh, boom is so that it doesn't accumulate debris, especially like right where the stairway is. Um, and also just the natural uh, flushing of the dam, um, like in a regular river system, you know, stuff does need to kind of keep moving along. And if 
there's accumulated surface debris um, and all the oils and everything in one location. And then you know, I'm sure it probably there's more sedimentation right in that spot of all that stuff. Uh, over time, does it create an issue? And I'm just curious sort of what, what thoughts are around there and what options or changes that we could possibly make um, if, if, if any are needed. Thank you. Mr. Sims. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, no, I think we're well aware of this one, and this is the subject of discussions with dam safety, uh, the, the dam safety branches, as a result of their direction that we, we shifted things around here. And we recognize the previous sort of pattern where the, the small surface debris would be flushed down the spillway, and that was pretty straightforward and simple. Um, and it, it did keep the, the surface of the lake clean. The, the risk is when, you know, the likelihood is small, that the, the consequences are uh, not good at all. The risk is that the lower spillway gets plugged. And so that's part of the motivation. And I, I swore I'd never, um, after last time, never sort of defend the, the regulator's position, but the, that's part of what there's, was motivating uh, dam safety to require this. Uh, but uh, having heard the concerns expressed by uh, the delegation, certainly in the, the last several months, we're um, committed to revisiting this with dam safety. So that, that's where the, the, there's a number of options, as you say, Councilor Gesserbrock. Thank you. I, I, I'm pulling myself from laughing. It's really funny hearing dam all the time, dam safety regulators. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's understandable. There's sort of like provincial regulate, regulations and we're having to comply. Um, I think, you know, myself would be very interested in sort of what is the, 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 the spectrum of options that, that are available. And, um, you know, if it's something that council needs to request at a certain point or, you know, make a formal request to the the uh, dam uh, regulators. Uh, we, you know, it'd be something that I'd be interested in. I, I think that a balance does need to be had and weighing the risks. And if, um, yeah, I'm not sure how much leeway council has in terms of you know being the response, the ones responsible for ultimately making that that risk assessment, weighing sort of the recreational needs with, you know, the risk of. You know, large failures, but uh, I would be uh, interested in in seeing sort of the spectrum of, of of that if it is an ongoing issue when where staff are you know and put in top difficult position where they're having to decide between these values. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hammonds. Thank you, Chair. Um, noting that the um, delegation's concerns are mostly around aesthetics, what's the cleaning schedule of the boom? And what's that process look like? Chair, sure, that's <clears throat> an appreciated question because that was on the tip of my tongue as well. And just so this, we haven't been as diligent as we could have. And I, I know both uh, Parks Operations, Ms. Davis is here to speak a little bit to, but also Mr. Squire's staff are now collaborating on a more frequent basis. Uh, one of the, so just, just to keep that, um, to keep the debris raked away and, and uh, cleaned up on a more frequent basis. Mr. Squire, did you have a follow-up? Yes, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, just in regards to the actual boom itself, and we've talked a lot about public safety and around dams, and that's the other aspect of the actual boom location because it was reviewed by MIA as a hazard, as a high-risk hazard. So we had to address not only dam safety requirements, but also MIA and inspection by MIA. So they recommended that the boom be put between or to, to actually look at the existing spillway to block it from actually protecting the public. So it's doing two things. It's removing the debris from the spillway, accumulating in the spillway, but also protecting the public. And most of the debris comes down in the winter time. When we have the storms, we'll collect the debris. We've been in there several times and it's been fairly minor this winter. And in the summertime, we're not gonna expect a lot of debris accumulating there because it just doesn't happen. So out of respect to the park users swimming there, we'll, we'll keep an eye on over the summertime, but we don't expect a lot. And hopefully we'll have it clean for the use of people swimming in the summer. Right, just to follow up with that then, so what you're saying is that uh, if we didn't follow through with what MIA and the dam safety branch said, we wouldn't have, we would be extremely liable if something was to happen or we may not even have insurance, correct? 
That's correct. Thank you. You want to follow up? Yeah. Thank you. And I just want to be clear that th is it reasonable to, to assume then that the boom could look different in the future as a result of this feedback from the delegation? As a result of? The feedback we received today. It's, it's, it's conceivable. As I said, we would be following up with dam safety to see if there's a way that we can, we can reconfigure it. But it is going to come down to maintenance, essentially keeping the, the junk away. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Perino. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Just also want to thank Mr. Solomon. Excellent presentation. Appreciated it very much. Um, but through you, Chair, I, I was wondering, talking about the cleanliness around the boom, how often do we, do we literally take a rake and, and pull it to the shore and pick it up? And is that done on, what, a weekly basis, a monthly basis? I'm just, I'm just wondering, because we've been asked by the public and don't know, I don't know the exact Yeah, it's um, something, it's, it's periodic, depending on if a okay. storm comes through. Um, we're there weekly. Uh, we have a dam inspector going through, okay. and we you know, notices it accumulating. Um, he'll clean it up. Uh, okay. It's been fairly minor this winter, and um, having regular meetings with Charlotte's group and Parks, and it's a collaborative effort, and we're, we're all looking after this. Okay, and then the other the other question that I had, if if I might, just another another quick one was, should we be ever considering raising the height of these dams? Anyone that no, we don't we don't need the water, any more water to be retained. Good, thanks. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, uh, we'll move on to our next one, which is uh, development procedures and notification bylaw update, and that's Mr. Holm. And thank you to our delegations as well as our presenters. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair and Committee. Uh, this, uh, the next uh, uh, presentation here uh, relates to the development approval procedures and notification bylaw uh, review that uh, was undertaken um, in the last year. Um, we're presenting um, uh, a, um, uh, seeking actually the committee's uh, guidance on a, cu a couple of items that are more, um, I guess, so substantive potential amendments to the bylaw um, and uh, looking for some recommendations from the committee around that. Uh, in general, the, um, the bylaw um, amendments that we'll be looking at um, other than that are more administrative in nature and would uh, likely be brought forward, well, will be brought forward to, uh, to council uh, for consideration, but we thought we'd take an opportunity um, to update uh, the committee on the, uh, the review of the bylaw, which is, um, Quite an important bylaw when it comes to uh, uh, giving some some guidance and direction to uh, applicants, and as as well as providing guidance on um, direction on uh, application requirements. It, it guides notification related to development approval applications as well. So uh, a number of um, administrative amendments have been identified that uh, you'll you'll hear about at the council table. They're uh, fairly administrative and minor in nature, but we're bringing forward a couple of um, more substantive and and um, uh, discretionary items that uh, we were hoping to get uh, committee uh, guidance on and uh, Ms. Rowett um, will uh, will present on that um, and uh, as well um, as Ms. Mays. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holm, and thank you, uh, members of council. Uh, we're pleased to provide this update today and I'm gonna give a bit of context um, and, uh, and then I'll turn it over to Ms. Mays to outline some of the proposed changes for which we're seeking committee recommendations on today. If I can, thank you. As outlined in the staff report, the existing development approval procedures and notification bylaw, um, oh, sorry, this review was initiated in 2023. Um, this current work is part of a suite of initiatives that are part of the city's development approval process review, or DAPR as you've heard and all of that being with the intent of streamlining um, and finding efficiencies in our development approval processes. Staff engaged a consultant, and uh, through this bylaw review, we looked at the existing bylaw, which is primarily uh, gives guidance to outline the requirements for development application submissions, public notification requirements for public hearings, and other matters as well that are more administrative in nature, including template forms for application submissions or development proposal signage on properties. Uh, research, we've researched some best practices with the assistance of the consultant as well, and looking at other municipal procedure bylaws, 
The intent is to modernize the current bylaw with a number of reg uh, references to legislation in the bylaw that are now out of date. So updating the citations, clarifying any language, uh, making sure there's no gaps in the procedures so it's clear both for applicants and staff what are the procedures concerning development approvals. And also to recommend some new procedures where maybe we haven't had in the past, such as managing inactive applications. Again, trying to have more transparency and efficiencies there. Of course, staff also considered um, the implications of the new Bill 44 um, housing statutes with respect to our approval procedures. Um, you're going to hear more about that um, at the next GPC as we talk more on the regulatory aspect, but today we're just focusing on the procedural framework as a result of Bill 44. And of course, when the draft bylaw is introduced um, for the procedures and notification bylaw, it will outline some in, in more detail what the proposed changes are. We just wanted to touch on some key, key areas we need some uh, direction today. Um, and as staff presented in January of this year, um, the Bill 44 statutes establish new procedural requirements, uh, as I mentioned, around public hearings and public notification. And so these were considerations that we had to take into account for this new bylaw update that we were already in well underway. This, of course, outlined, as you've probably already heard many times, three scenarios for public hearings specifically. The first being mandatory uh, public hearings. This is where we have an official community plan. Um, I think most recently the last OCP amendment was the Tay Tuxton project at 5th and, and, and Harewood. Um, also where a zoning bylaw is not consistent with an OCP. Those are two cases where an, a public hearing is mandatory. The second scenario is discretionary public hearings. And these are where a zoning bylaw amendment is consistent with city plan, our OCP. Council must decide whether to hold or not to hold a public hearing. And this decision has to be made prior to considering the bylaw. Before Bill 44 came forward, Council had the ability to waive public hearings. And that had to be done with notice given prior to third reading. The only change essentially is that now notice has to be given prior to first reading. So it's really more of a procedural change that um, you'll, you'll notice as we go forward, as council will still have the opportunity to decide whether or not to hold a public hearing for bylaws that are consistent with the OCP. The third type of public hearings would be um, prohibited hearings. This being, of course, the more significant change with the Bill 44 enactment. Council is prohibited to hold a public hearing for a zoning bylaw amendment that is consistent with city plan and is primarily residential. And that means that there's more than 50% of the proposed gross floor area um, for that residential use. Most recently, for example, I believe we had, um, uh, Ms. Mays had a project a rezoning application we brought forward for 6124 Metro Drive. Um, so again, multifamily residential development, that would have been an example where the public hearing would have been prohibited. To give council an idea of how many applications this could affect potentially, we took a look at the last five years in which we've received 94 applications, whether they're OCP and or zoning bylaw amendments. And of those, approximately 48% would have been prohibited outright from having a public hearing. Now, council could have decided to not hold public hearings for more, if not all of those um, projects that would have been consistent with the OCP as well. When we go forward and we are holding a public hearing, um, it's just good to keep in, in mind that the process will not change in terms of how we do public notification, um, receiving written submissions, and the format of the hearing as well. It's really only in addressing when a public hearing is not held or prohibited, that's where we will see a change with the notice prior to first reading. Um, the notice, of course, in itself will be similar. We'll do mail outs. Um, and the notice, the purpose of the notice is really to tell people where they can examine the bylaw and to know the date of when council will consider first reading. You're going to be hearing a little bit more today from uh, legislative services about the, um, we've been working concurrently on pr related procedure bylaws. And so the council procedure bylaw, of course, addresses things like delegations. And so um, there's, we've had a lot of review and discussion about um, 
options to consider for addressing delegations that may wish to speak when there is no public hearing. So there'll be some more opportunity to learn about that today. And Ms. Mays is now gonna go uh, outline the two proposed changes to the procedures and notification bylaw that we're seeking the committee's recommendations on today. Thank you, Ms. Rowett. Um, so as mentioned by Ms. Rowett, um, we have two areas where we're hoping for some committee uh, direction. The first being public information meetings. So this is currently a voluntary practice at the City of Nanaimo. Um, so these are hosted by the applicants for OCP and zoning bylaw amendments, as well as for significant development permits. The purpose of these meetings is to be very informal. So it's usually an open house. Um, it is uh, applicant directed. Um, there's that opportunity for outreach earlier in that process. It's an opportunity for the applicant to share information and to answer questions, and as well to allow for discussions and any adjustments in that proposal before council considers that application. Um, uh, in terms of other jurisdictions, um, we reviewed 13 other jurisdictions and their development procedure bylaws. Of that, um, five of them also require a public information meeting. And so we are coming forward to council with, um, with that recommendation as well. Um, this, these public information meetings as well, they also reinforce council's current neighborhood association support policy, which also encourages op uh, early and open dialogue, um, particularly for significant development permits. So that recommendation coming forward um, for consideration is uh, requiring for OCP and zoning bylaw amendments, as well as significant development permits with variances that cannot be delegated for approval. And those are, for example, um, with units over 100, uh, with the um, allowance to be waived uh, by the Director of Planning and Development. Uh, next one as well, thank you. Uh, and also too, we were hoping for some uh, direction as well on public notification. So public notification is currently required under the Local Government Act for a variety of applications. That includes OCP and zoning bylaw amendments, temporary use permits, and development variance permits. Um, currently, this bylaw establishes a notification distance of 10 meters, mm -hmm. or where there's an adjacent road. It's uh, a road width plus 10 meters. And so what we did was we took a look again at those 13 different um, jurisdictions and noted that for OCP and zoning bylaw amendments that those ranged from 30 to 100 meters. And for DVPs or sorry, development variance permits and temporary use permits, it was ranged anywhere from adjacent properties similar to what we have here, um, up to 100 meters depending on the application. And uh, what staff did is we did take a look and we found that um, although 100 being the max, an average between those jurisdictions was generally around 75, which is what staff are recommending uh, the committee consider um, for notification distances for uh, OCP and zoning bylaw amendments and to remain the same for DVPs or development variance permits and temporary use permits. The next uh, slide here you'll see is um, just a visual representation. So these are three different recent applications, 77 Chapel, um, 6124 Metro Drive, and uh, the Tetuxton project and what the notification distance would look like with the current extent, so that's 10 meters or the road width plus 10 meters, as well as the example 75 meter buffer that is uh, being proposed for consideration. Uh, what we put forward is a few options. So these sort of summarize, um, again, uh, reiterating that the first, uh, which is uh, the recommended um, direction is to require those public information meetings um, for OCP and zoning bylaw amendments, and again, those development permits that are uh, cannot be delegated. And that's, again, with that discretion of the uh, Director of Planning and Development to waive. Uh, the second being to maintain the existing practice. So that is to encourage voluntary public information meetings, um, of which uh, our development community tends to hold those. Um, the second, again, a uh, direction uh, to determine whether or not uh, the committee would like to see an increase of that notification distance. So that's from our current standard of 10 plus road plus, plus 10 meters to 75 meters, or to maintain the existing, um, which would be a blanket for, for all the different types of um, applications that require notification. So our next slide, um, we are hopefully going to turn it over to you um, to consider the options in front of you and, and provide some direction. 
Any questions, staff or council? Mayor Crow? Uh, if I may, thank you very much and much appreciate the presentation, the work of staff. Uh, just to confirm, we've only had responses from two neighborhood associations on this, correct? That's correct, Your Worship, from uh, Protection Island as well as Newcastle, and just would like to acknowledge them for taking the time to send in their stuff to us all. Absolutely, and, and appreciate the comments which are supportive of what staff has recommended, which is certainly the way I'm inclined to vote on this. Thank you. Um, not seeing any other ones, so I'll make my comments. I personally think 75 meters is too low. I would actually like to see 500 meters. I think they're all too small because the impacts are not just on the few neighboring houses. It impacts like a whole neighborhood. I, I think we should be going further, especially now that public hearings may not be required. Um, I know a lot of people think it's a lot, but I know you take a look at the green thumb, that's going to impact many people not within 75 meters. It's gonna impact people probably a kilometer from the site based on traffic patterns and stuff. But that's just my thoughts, and I'll just leave it at that. Councillor Hemmons. Thank you, Chair. A question, um, uh, would we ever require a public information meeting that we then wouldn't embed whatever the results of that consultation or that information meeting were in our council report? In terms of the public information meeting follow-up, um, if I understood the question correctly, we do ask currently, it's voluntarily, but we do expect that an applicant would provide a summary of comments. Um, and then we'd provide uh, just more for uh, capturing an idea of how many people attended a public information meeting, what was the nature of questions or comments shared. Um, and in our staff reports to, to council, that's where we would outline a brief summary of what the feedback was or even what staff observed at that meeting. So it's not a formal capturing, it's essentially just an informal brief summary of what was observed at the meeting. And would that, if I may, apply to development applications as well? Uh, sorry, to which? To development applications. I'm sorry, I'm just, I had a conversation with a resident this morning and we, um, we differ on our understanding that community consultation is embedded in OCP and zoning bylaw amendments, but we wouldn't necessarily see the results of a consultation that was held that is related to a development that is in line with city plan. Is that accurate? Right. Sorry, that's convoluted. I'm not sure there's no requirement for it. Okay, I'm just gonna read this verbatim, just so this so development applications do not currently have community consultation results in their reports to council. It's only OCP okay. rezoning reports. But that communities are actually asked for that input. So is there ever uh, um, a circumstance where community is asked for input and council does not receive it? Thank you, and through the chair, um, I was wondering if it was related to development permit applications, okay. right? Yes, yes, so for development permit applications, um, there is no, there has never been a formal public hearing because they're developing under existing zoning. Um, we have informally encouraged applicants in the past to reach out to neighborhood associations, particularly where there are significant developments. Um, and so through the course of developing proposed changes to this bylaw, that is being suggested is that um, at, again, at the discretion of the director, there's the opportunity to require public information meetings for significant development permit applications where there are um, variances that would, either by variance or uh, nature of the scale of the project, such as more than 100 units, would not be able to be delegated for approval. So th that would capture a more significant applications. Um, and in that case, what this is suggesting is that they would be required to have a public information meeting. Councillor Eastmere and then Perino. Uh, thank you. Um, through you, Councillor Hammonds asked my question about how the results get captured and communi communicated to council, so I appreciate that. Uh, I think what, Councillor Armstrong, you raised about the 100 meter or have, increasing it from 75 meters, I do think we should be on the upper end of that average just given the size of the city. And um, so I would support if you wanted to move a motion on increasing it to 100 meters notification. Um, that's go ahead. I'd be happy but when we when we get we're not at a motion yet So if somebody wants to get the motion to add that Okay, yes. Councillor Prino uh, you, Question to staff through you just in discussion around the um, information uh, Sorry, not the notification Going from say 10 meters to 75 meters. How do we notify people? I have a couple of questions around that. Yes. Thank you through the chair So in terms of the notification of the yeah. change uh, no, just how do we notify people, yes. Um, so we currently do, uh, staff in, internally, we would prepare a, a map 
So basically a mapping exercise to find uh, buffering from the property okay. or the subject, the area of the site. It's okay. not always to the property boundaries, but the yes. subject lands um, and using mapping tools essentially to measure out the 10 meters or the no, road width plus 10 meters to identify property. Sorry, I'm, thro I'm throwing you off. I, I meant, how do you notify the public? Do you send them Through a letter mail. in the mail? Oh, thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Absolutely, uh, mail outs. Okay, and so the, re the reason I'm asking the question is, if you do 10 meters now, and we increase it to 100 meters, or as, mm -hmm. as uh, our chair has suggested, possibly 500 meters, that's a huge increase in the costing. And we, as, this, as the city, pays, pay for that. Is that correct? Through the chair, yes, that is correct. There would be some increased cost um, for the postage for those. Um, I should note, of course, with uh, public hearings. Yeah. Um, those also have newspaper advertisements. There's other forms of advertisement, but mail outs, um, what we're talking about, would increase with, with increasing notification distance, there would be potential for increased po postage. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, just one question I have, and, and that's going to, to a motion, because I don't want to move the motion. I'll get someone else to move one. If we were to look at, let's say, number one, could we also include, and that the applicant provide a summary of the engagement in a report to council? Or is that something you wouldn't recommend? <clears throat> Thank you, Chair, for the question. I believe that in the draft bylaw, we do contemplate having language in there. So again, you don't have the bylaw in front of you. We're just seeking uh, some recommendation from the committee to inform the bylaw. So um, the thought is to give uh, a, a little bit more of a description as to what would be expected of applicants. And, and there'll be an opportunity for council to see that full bylaw language in front of them. Um, we anticipate in April bringing that forward. That's something I would like to see because it's great to do it, but if we don't get the information back and we don't require it, we may not. I mean, most developers are going to be good and give it to us, but yeah. So is there anybody who would like to make a motion on these? Uh, Councillor Eastmuir? Oh, excuse me, just Mr. Lindsay. Just, just before we get into motions, I think Mr. Holm might want to speak to this, but I just want to remind Council there's, there's more than one way that we notify neighbours and the, the yes. handout, yes. the delivery to back to your question Councillor Carino we do the mail we still do handouts also if I no. on certain applications we do a combination to make sure that because there's always an issue of do you hit the owner or do you hit the tenant like trying to cover that off but maybe Mr. Holm can speak to some of the other ways that we do notice Mr. Holm? Uh, sure yeah thank you uh, thanks Mr. Lindsay um, yeah so I'll just try and expand on a little bit on um, the other methods that we use to notify so it depends on the application type but uh, for OCP and, and rezoning, there's also a requirement for a newspaper notification. We also notify through uh, our, our website um, and, uh, and social media sources as well. And we, we also have our What's Building um, in the NIMO um, uh, tool, which is uh, something that uh, residents can subscribe to receive notifications on development status updates. Uh, but we do um, uh, as well uh, do deliveries, as Mr. Lindsay mentioned. Um, so this is really, it's the delivery radius that we're talking about uh, for the most part here, but there are other um, methods to reach a broader audience or those that are that are interested in um, uh, application status as well. And uh, there's uh, signage on site that's also updated with the um, uh, public hearing date, uh, et cetera. So, uh, well, although um, th with the provincial legislative changes, we're likely to see less public hearings. Um, as, as we've indicated, it's hard to tell exactly how, how many uh, fewer at this point, but for residential developments, they, they'll be prohibited. Uh, Chair, I, I just, I, I should apologize. I, I, the reason I was asking was the distance between 10 meters to say 500 meters is quite substantial and the cost would increase considerably. And that was my concern more about you know, what, what would that entail? That's why I was asking the question. And I'm not adverse to, you know, going up to 100 meters at all. I've, I've, I've not a problem with that one. I, maybe, maybe if I could through the chair too, just to add to that. So obviously um, we, we do have at this point, I mean, we do mail out um, uh, for deliveries, but we, we have had uh, staff doing uh, 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 delivery as well yes. um, to, to tenants, but uh, which is, you know, that'd be quite substantial. I mean, right now we're at, at 10 meters. We're definitely on the on the lower end of... of um, it is low. Yeah, of, of what uh, we've it's found in, in reviewing uh, other um, municipalities of, of similar yes. scale comparables. Um, so yeah, what uh, what we're proposing here would, um, would be more in line with what we're seeing in other places. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Madam Chair, sorry. can I just add, because I think the other important thing for council to consider is when you're, if you're increasing the, the distance and you heard the, the number from uh, Mr. Rowett this morning about, if you look on our past number of applications, I think you said almost 
um, under the new legislation, we would be prohibited from holding a public hearing. So if you're increasing the notification distance, just keep in mind, we're telling more people that they're not allowed to participate in a public hearing process. Yeah, that's good. Let them know. It's not our decision. Anyhow, Councillor Eastmere. Yes, so yeah, I, I appreciate the context around um, the different ways that we notify people. I think if any, learning anything uh, from being on council up to this point, people are not getting the information, like they're not seeing it in the paper, they're not seeing it on social media, they're not going to our website. And that we're, like I, I know that we're really trying our best, but the way that people are accessing information, just because of the how the media landscape has shifted so much, how Facebook al algorithms are have changed so much, um, it's like actively suppressing information that's coming from uh, Facebook pages unless you're actually paying for it. Um, and just because of the, the growth of the city and people's desire to, to have information, I do think changing from 75 meters to 100 meters is relatively small, but is in, in keeping in line with what you're saying, um, that sort of the, the range, like up to 100 meters. And I do think bumping it up to 100 meters is just us doing as much as we can and given the size of Nanaimo being a significant size of city, uh, that would make me more comfortable in knowing that we've done what we can to uh, notify people. And so, sorry, I shouldn't be speaking to it before I put the motion on the put floor. Put the motion on but, the floor um, and speak to it. So my, the motion would be just for, regarding the public notification distances, number one, increasing it from 75 meters to 100 meters. Seconded by uh, Councillor Hemmons. Yeah, now I appreciate you discuss. that clarification, actually. So it, currently our uh, range is 10 meters. We'd be bumping it up to 100 meters. Any discussion, Council? Mayor Krogh? Uh, thank you, and, and if, if I may first, uh, just a question to staff. Uh, of the 94 applications you mentioned, um, how many would it involve the 75 versus 10 meter, et cetera, et cetera? Any idea, ballparkish, Mr. Cohn? Um, yeah, that would be um, all, of, all of those applications. Those were a zoning amendment or OCP amendment applications. The 95 that uh, Ms. Rowett um, spoke to? Uh, I'm not inclined to support uh, the increase to 100 as opposed to 75. And uh, this is one of those occasions where I'm, I'm, I'm siding, and I wouldn't say siding, but let me just say I'm supporting staff's position on this. And, and the reason for that is simply this. And, and the chair used the example of um, uh, the Green Thumb property. Uh, everybody's going to be talking and knowing about it. So if it's a major change in the area, people are, with great respect, going to be aware of it. We will be imposing, if you will, on what might be relatively small developments, a great deal of requirement for notice. And I'm conscious of the fact that we have a, uh, a letter that I saw from staff because there was a complaint about the lack of response by transportation to folks on uh, Lost Lake Road with respect to potential further changes to reduce traffic. 200 letters were sent out and only 52 people responded. And of those, 73% didn't want uh, further changes and upgrades. So uh, with respect, um, I I'm not prepared to support uh, that we can do 75 for a few years and if we discover that we're completely misreading the public or the public's outraged by this um, Then so be it, but we have Two responses only from our neighborhood associations and they're both supportive of what staff has recommended so I, I'm just Not prepared to go for the whole hog at this stage um, I'm not, uh, I've, I've used that joke before, it's not a joke, it was something Mackenzie King once said, why do something by halves when you can do it by quarters? So I'm, I'm inclined to go slow on this because quite frankly, there's going to be enough turmoil uh, in the development industry around uh, all of the changes that have been uh, brought about by the province with the best of intentions and fairness. So uh, I, I'm just not prepared to make that, uh, pardon the, the jump from 75 to to 100. Ms. Rowett. Thank you, Chair. Um, I 
should have mentioned earlier that um, also these development applications, official community plan amendments, rezonings, development permits, they are referred to or sent for information to uh, neighborhood associations. So there is a direct contact from staff to the associations with information about the application and directing them to the What's Building website so they can see updates there as well. Thank you. Councillor Perino. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just a question through you to staff. So I'm, I'm inclined to uh, agree with uh, with Mayor Croak on this one. I, I would have been fine with 75. I just, what is the norm across the province? Is it about 75 or is it, I mean, are, do you see many going up to 100? I don't want to slow the development system down at all. I think, you know, we need to make processes that make it quicker, not slower. That, that's why I'm asking the question. Perfect. Through the chair to Councillor Perino. So City of Victoria, yeah. City of Kamloops, City of Coquitlam, Township of Langley, they all have 100 meters. District of North Vancouver, 75 to 100, 100 for OCP and rezonings. Okay. There are some 90s and 60s and 50s sort of mixed in there, but the standard was around on, on the higher end. On the higher end. Um, well, given that, sorry, Mayor Croak, I think I'll support it, thank you. All right, seeing no further questions or any uh, comments, call the question, all those in favor? I see Councillor Eastmere, Hammonds, Armstrong, Perino, and Gazelbrecht, those opposed, Mayor Krogh, <laughs> motion passes. Thank you. And do we have uh, somebody that wants to move? The sure. Public first one. Second. Seconded by Councillor Hammonds. Any discussion? Yes. Councillor Perino. Uh, Chair, thank you. Are we, are we recommending the um, number one or number two Said of the first one. one? Number one of it, thank you. And then for myself, for follow-up, and you said you'll be addressing the fact that we will require um, the applicant to provide a summary at the bylaw time, or should we put, include that now? I, I believe, um, Ms. Miskin, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that our draft bylaw does have language in there outlining um, the requirement for public information meeting. Um, and, and certainly in the comprehensive letters we provide through the application review process, we, we provide guidance on what feedback or any kind of summary is to be provided. It's meant to be somewhat flexible um, because it is an informal step in the process, but it's just meant to give us an understanding and staff attend those meetings as well to observe so we can validate the comments that we've received. I just think it's really important and I think Councillor Eastman touched on it that we do get that feedback. So I would instead of rather having it informal, I would rather have it formal so that there is no uh, miscommunication from the developers saying, well, we don't have to do it. Um, if I may, uh, Chair, I think one, one consideration that we also have been um, advised to keep in mind in all of this is that uh, to avoid anything, any consultation or any appearance of consultation that may appear to be a formal public hearing in our process, particularly where they are prohibited. Um, so this uh, feedback that we have received, we've, we've consulted with our solicitor as well um, and attended many legal webinars as well, um, the draft bylaw considerations that we're discussing now and we'll bring to council have had legal review and so this this was the avenue that was recommended Perfect. that we proceed and make it very clear so the expectations are clear for applicants as well it is a requirement unless otherwise waived and and it's meant to be informal earlier in the process perfect thank you so much any other discussion council seeing none call the question all in favor mayor krogh east mayor hammonds armstrong prino Gesselbrock in favor or opposed? In favor. Motion carries. Moving on to our next one, which is Ms. Gurry. Thank you very much for the presentation and the work. Council procedure, bylaw amendments. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Robertson in just a moment, but um, just to the previous conversation around engagement, I just I had some interesting stat from November. We had a member of the public inquire as to um, how often our website is actually looked at um, for advertisement purposes, for notices, et cetera, that we post on our website. And it, IT looked into it um, and responded back to that member of the public. And the numbers were quite staggering. The average number of people or views per month of our website in November, so for the month of November, was 274,000. And so per day, that's almost 10,000 views per day. So it might not be 10,000 people, obviously, but it's 10,000 people per day or 274 views. views. So people going to our website, um, where they go from there, we don't know specifically each page, 
but those views to our website. So that I found rather interesting. Thank you. So on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Robertson, who um, is complementing the previous presentation and the changes um, from Bill 44 and the housing statutes um, to amendments um, to our council procedure bylaw that will um, help with those amendments and that um, Bill 44 changes. So um, I'd just like to thank her for her amazing thorough report as per usual, and she'll walk you through some of those proposed changes as well as some other amendments, um, housekeeping and um, um, streamlining amendments that we would like to propose. Uh, before you start, Mayor Krogh has a comment. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and, and you'll forgive me. I, I'm inspired by Ms. Gurry's comments. No wonder there's so many keyboard warriors in this town and obesity's become a problem. There's too many people spending too much time in front of their screens instead of getting off their duffers. Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Robertson. <laughs> Good afternoon, Council. So as highlighted in the previous presentation, uh, the province recently made some significant changes affecting residential development, one of which is amendments to Section 464 of the Local Government Act, which is affecting public hearings for certain land use uh, planning applications. And the changes introduced by the Housing Statutes Amending Act now limit the discretion that was previously afforded to councils as it related to how public input could be gathered when local governments cannot hold public hearings. So these changes are quite significant and were implemented very quickly. Uh, so the city's law firm put on a virtual legal uh, workshop in February for their clients uh, where there was an opportunity to hear what these changes would mean for local governments and to ask questions and to go over some of the best practices for how we would then receive public engagement when public hearings cannot be held. So some of the recommendations that were discussed about uh, receiving public engagement when a public hearing cannot be held. Uh, was adopting an alternative forms of public notification bylaw that allows for other forms of engagement. And uh, council already adopted one of these bylaws last February in, or in May 2022. Another suggestion was to enact development procedure policies to set out alternate forms of public engagement when a hearing is prohibited, such as allowing written submissions or as suggested to the previous presentation, uh, and Council's motion is to have the, the developer hold public information meetings where members of the public will have that opportunity to ask questions about the development early in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, also, as discussed earlier, referencing written submissions or other forms of public engagement in staff reports and having local governments amend their council procedure bylaws to incorporate provisions when public hearings are prohibited. And it is that provision that was the impetus for my report today. So um, just going backwards until the new legislation came into effect, public hearings were for the most part mandatory for rezoning applications and members of the public would be able to attend those meetings to state whether they'd supported the application and provide their comments. With some exceptions, a hearing is generally considered a hearing when you have a quorum of council, a proposed development bylaw and in-person submissions. And that was sort of the big, uh, the big takeaway. So one of the biggest questions staff had then was on how delegations for those rezoning applications would be considered in the absence of a hearing, as currently council's procedure bylaw allows for unlimited delegations for up to five minutes each if the matter is on the agenda. So uh, if those cases where public hearings cannot be held, advertising the application, and it has to be advertised for first reading of the bylaw that it's gonna come to council, so what if members or the public just simply signed up to be a delegation when it comes to council at first reading in the absence of a hearing? So that question was posed at the legal seminar and to the city solicitor and staff were advised that by permitting delegations at first reading, it kind of could indirectly do what is prohibited by the new legislation, which is holding uh, a de facto public hearing. It was also by, uh, noted that by allowing this, it could give some rise to procedural fairness as the notice that was sent to the pro uh, surrounding property owners would indicate that there is no public hearing. And then if a neighbor, you know, in chatting with their other neighbor finds out, that, well, actually I went to council and spoke when it was at first reading and they might feel a little bit slighted that they, well, how come I didn't get that opportunity? So to ensure that that doesn't occur, some wording for changing the delegation provisions in council's procedure bylaw was provided by the city solicitor for council's consideration. 
And so given that we needed to bring that for topic forward anyways today, uh, staff also took the opportunity to bring forward other proposed amendments based on some observations from meetings since the last round of uh, procedure amendments and some including housekeeping amendments based on policies that council recently adopted. So to make, the, to make it a little bit easier, my plan today was to just sort of provide a quick overview of each proposed amendment in numerical order as outlined in the staff report, then seek direction on each of the changes before going on to the next one. And then once all of those amendments um, are voted on today, they would then be moved up to council for consideration those uh, endorsed there would then come back in the form of the bylaw for consideration of three readings on April 8th. So unless council has any questions, I'll just start with the first one. So the very first amendment is on uh, section 9.1 of the procedure bylaw, which is page 54 of your agenda. And this amendment uh, is just really housekeeping in nature. It's simply to add a correspondence heading to the order of proceedings and business to accommodate the letters of support and council correspondence policy that uh, was recently adopted. And so by including that in, this would be the section where we would add those letters of support when they come forward or if council from the information packages says, I'd like to have this go in the count, council agenda package, that's the spot we would put, put it in. So unless there's any questions on that one, staff would just be looking for a recommendation for the committee to direct staff to add correspondence section to council's procedure bylaw. Made by Councillor Hemmings, second by Councillor Eastmere. Any discussion? Seeing none, call the question. All in favor? Unanimous. Okay. The second amendment, which is for section 19.4C, and that's on page 58, and this relates to delegations pertaining to council agenda items. Um, this is a clarification um, just by adding the words been acted upon by council. Uh, in section C. So the existing wording implies that when a matter has been referred to staff by council that it has already been reviewed by council. However, adding the wording uh, as proposed just clarifies the intent. So um, if supported staff would just seek a motion from the committee to add that section in as well to the bylaw. So instead of it reading, just refer the matter to the appropriate department if the matter has already been referred to staff, it, it would say refer the matter to the appropriate department if the matter has already been acted upon by council or been referred to staff by council. Moved by Councillor Eastmere, seconded Councillor Hammonds. Any discussion? Seeing none, called question. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Next one, 19.4. So the next, in, next amendment is the substance of the staff report as it relates to delegations associated with the new public hearing rules. And there's two options for council's consider, consideration. And the first option would give the public the opportunity to still continue to be a delegation at any time up to public hearing or third reading where a public hearing is prohibited. And this, this option is basically unchanged from what our current provision is with one additional restriction on delegations after third reading for zoning bylaw amendments where a public hearing has been held or prohibited. As after third reading, really the applicant at that point is working to complete uh, the conditions of rezoning as per council's request. If uh, council were to select that option though, it does carry the risk as the intent is to, to not have the public hearings. Um, but this, um, it's fairly new, they're fairly new statutory provisions that haven't been tested in the court yet either. So council may want to take a wait and see approach and see what happens. The second option is the one that was provided for by uh, the city solicitor and it was the discussion of the seminar and it addresses many of the concerns as it relates to not having public hearings. It clarifies uh, the delegation procedures when a public hearing is prohibited, where council decides not to hold a public hearing where a public hearing is required or where council decides to hold a public hearing. And legally, this is the safest option of the two. It is worth noting, however, that under both options, uh, members of the public would still be allowed to um, contact council members or staff uh, informally throughout the entire application process. So the first one would be to refuse to place delegation on the agenda if the matter relates to a bylaw in respect of which a public or statutory hearing has already been held or where third reading has been given. Or the second one, uh, the safer one, which is to refuse to place a delegation on the agenda if the matter relates to a bylaw in respect to which a public hearing is prohibited in accordance with section 464 of the Local Government Act. Notice of first reading has been given because no public hearing will be held or 
number three has already been held. Which one are you moving? Uh, moved by count, n number two is being moved by Councillor Prino and seconded by Councillor Hammonds. Is there discussion? Seeing no discussion, call the question. All in favor? Oh, oh. oh. Didn't sorry. Didn't see your hand, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so, so just clarity, the one being moved is to, to change it or, or, or is that the status quo, the second one? There, the one, the one to change it would be the second one. Okay, and that's what's on the floor at the moment. Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any further discussion, Council? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Uh, Eastmuir, Prino, Armstrong, Krogh, Hammonds. Councilor Gieselbrecht in favor or opposed? Opposed. Okay, Councilor uh, Gieselbrecht's opposed. Motion carries. Moving on. Okay, the next option for council to consider pertains to section 19.9, which is still on page 58 of your agenda regarding the amount of time that delegations are permitted to address council. Currently delegations both on agenda items and not on agenda items are given five minutes each to present unless a longer time period is permitted by unanimous vote of all council members present. There is also no limit to the number of delegations that can appear before council provided the topic is on the agenda. So staff were looking to see what other municipalities are doing in this area and some for Vernon, uh, uh, for example, they have a time limit of five minutes, but they restrict the number of delegations to four for each meeting unless approved by the mayor. Langley has a maximum of three delegations that are given five minutes each unless unanimous vote of all council members support allowing more. Others have no limits, but will not accept delegations that are provided a minimum of 12 days prior to an agenda being circulated. And so this option does not give members of the public an opportunity to address council on matters related to an agenda topic. Others such as Parksville limit the number of delegations to three and if say two of the three delegations are speaking in favor or opposed to a matter, only one per side is allowed to speak before council. So limiting the number of delegations can pose a problem whereby citizens can stack the meeting by getting a delegation request in early to take all the available slots. Um, that actually happened in an organization I worked at previously. We're standing right there. <laughs> They're gonna get every, every spot they could. Um, having an unlimited number, however, with five minutes each does have the potential to overshadow other important topics on the agenda. So staff are putting forward the option of unlimited delegations, but reducing the time limit from five minutes to three minutes, not unlike what is provided at some of the city's public hearings and at the recent uh, Nanaimo Operations Center governance and priority session. That way, hot topics can be accommodated within a council meeting without having to call a special meeting and without having to limit the number of delegations. And if supportive of this option, staff suggest giving council more flexibility by giving council the option to extend that time period with either only a two thirds vote or even a majority vote of all council members present versus the existing unanimous vote of council. As always, members of the public have, uh, can send their comments by email, phone, letter, or provide commentary through the Get Involved Nanaimo forum if they wish to provide information. And just for clarity, this has, uh, uh, is not to do with presentations where council has invited somebody to speak or consultants. That's a completely different section. So the two options before council for consideration are to either amend the time limit from five minutes to three minutes and then change the uh, number of members required to extend the time period or to retain the status quo at five minutes. Councilor Gezelbrock, do you have your hand up? Um, yeah, my question uh, to staff is that, say if we change this, then all delegations to any type of um, agenda item would be limited to three minutes. That's right. Okay. And, unless the majority of council um, were to, at the time, grant an extension to the person. So let's say they had some really interesting discussion going on and council wanted to hear more. Council by majority vote could certainly say yes, you can take another five minutes to continue on. Right, okay. Okay, thank you. Councillor Eastmere? Uh, I, pardon me? Could I put a, the motion on the floor and then speak to it, or are we just asking questions at this point? Certainly put the motion on the floor. I would uh, move option two that we retain 
the status quo five minutes. Is there a seconder? Seconder. Seconded by Councilor Gisbrook. Do you want to speak to it and then I'll go to Mayor Krull? Yes, I think um, my preference for leaving it at five minutes uh, is really it. Number one, this is the main way that people can engage with council on an issue. Um, and I think that a huge part of our job is listening to members of the public and they already have so, there's the perception that there's already so few ways of engage, engaging with council in a formal way um, other than emailing us. So I think this is a, is a really important public engagement piece. And secondly, I think it's an accessibility issue. Um, for people coming to council, it's already very intimidating. And to try to condense your points into three minutes when you're already stressed, I, we get a lot of feedback from people that they can't fit all their points into five minutes. And I think just having that hanging over your head where you would only speak for two minutes and then you'd get a one minute warning, I think that really adds to um, the, the stress of an already stressful situation. So I'm comfortable with leaving it at five minutes. I think this is a huge part of our job to be here. And even if it makes for a long meeting, like that's that's the gig. Mayor Krogh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. And, and, and I certainly appreciate the recommendation of staff to reduce to three minutes, and I understand the reasoning why. Uh, having said that, um, if, uh, if, if someone comes here expecting to speak for three minutes and we've decided it's an issue where we're happy to hear them for five, that completely changes the nature of their presentation. And it's done without notice to them with great respect. And I don't mean that in an unkind way, but you, you're going to be told the rule is three minutes. You're gonna arrive here and maybe council in its wisdom says, oh no, tonight we wanna hear for, you can have up to five minutes. Well, that's not fair to the public. Uh, it strikes me that if we're, if we're going to, it's, it's one thing to have three minutes at a public hearing. I get that, where you're likely to have a whole bunch of people out, you're just wanting to really hear, are they in favor or are they opposed? I mean, that's, what, that's the question we ask them. Are you in favor or are you opposed? And state your name, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the, this applies to delegations. So Mr. Solomon today would have had three minutes. Council Gesbrecht. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm uh, in favor of the motion of cumulative status quo for the reasons outlined by uh, Director Eastmere and, and, and Mayor Kroga. I think that uh, five minutes is already, uh, you know, quite, you know, it's, a lot of people do complain about just like the limited amount of, of time to speak. Um, and I think that I'm, I'd be willing to deal with, you know, on the odd cases when we have um, a development permit, um, you know, or, or, a, or a zoning change, having a lot of people speak and having to suffer through that evening, as opposed to having it change for every delegation. I think a lot of people will be upset about that and I don't think it's serving sort of public dialogue. So thank you. Councilor Perino. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just a question of clarification. Are, are we only talking about the amount of time that we're allowing delegations to speak and are we going to come back then to an additional motion whether or not we're allowing the numbers of people? Is that is that correct? I just wanted to no, there's no there's no there's recommendation no. about uh, limiting it's only the number on time. of people. It's so just it's, the time. So it's, so it's only on time. Yeah. Okay, and I'll be voting in favor of this, and I agree with um, the comments said. I, I, my job is to sit here and listen to the public. I have no trouble at all. And five minutes, some of them are five minutes, some of them are two minutes. It doesn't bother me at all, one way or the other. Thank you. Councillor Hammonds. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not going to support the motion. I, I completely agree with everything that Councillor Eastmere has said, but we recently had a very contentious meeting where we did limit it to three minutes, and I think it worked beautifully. So just going on past practices, um, people were really prepared to speak, and I thought that worked well, so I'll be against. Thank you. Yeah, I too am voting against it. I think three minutes is more than enough. We, that's what we have at the UBCM for the main speaker, which is where the most business gets done, and then other speakers only have two minutes. Um, I think most people, there's a lot of verbiage in there, and if you actually left them to the three minutes, you would actually get to the points faster, and people would pay attention more. So oh, yeah. I think the three minutes is, is, and I looked at a lot of other areas, a lot of places only have two minutes, and the majority had three. I think we're very nice by giving five, so I too will be voting against. So, Councilor Gasbrook, you have another point? Uh, yeah, I've got a question to staff. Um, I mean, given that the issue is specifically with these you know, singular cases that don't happen too, too often. Um, yeah, are, is there a way of actually just having um, something in our procedural bylaw that bounds it to where it's, um, you know, 
development permit variance or a zoning amendment that in those cases, you know, we can, um, those specific agenda type items are limited to three minutes and, and not everything else. That might be a little bit complicated to flesh out. Like right now we do have a public hearing process policy and um, it's actually at the, at the mayor's discretion to allocate the time, but we do have a policy that outlines that for the most part it will be five minutes or three minutes depending on the size. Um, to Councillor Armstrong and Councillor Hammond's point, one thing, um, there, there are two aspects to the delegation um, piece here. The first is uh, for items that are on the agenda. There's another piece coming up shortly that are items not on the agenda. Uh, I, one could look at, well, if the topic is on the agenda, they're really coming forward to just express their opinion about whether they're in favor of what's on the agenda or not. Uh, that's maybe an opportunity where three minutes might be more appropriate. When you have the time slot or the, the number of slots for items not on the agenda, it's typically where somebody's coming forward with a new initiative. Maybe they need a little bit more time. Uh, they could be five minutes. It's just another way to look at it as well, but it's completely at, um, at your discretion. Do you have follow-up, Council Gezerbeck, or is that a holdover? Yeah, yeah, just a follow-up. So also to this limiting um, to three minutes, would also limit where we have like delegations that section delegations where it is as you're saying people not on the agenda those people would then be under this blanket reduction of three minutes as well that's a separate section that we're coming up with next in a few more pages so there, there is, right, but that, there, there's two separate sections so this so this is specifically for uh delegations for an agenda item and yes. not sort of like section delegations. So that section of delegations wouldn't be affected regardless of what we do here. That's right. Okay. Thank you. I'm still not, I'm still in favor of the motion, but I just make that clarity. Thanks. You're still holding spot. Okay. Mayor Krogh. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. And, and, and your comments have inspired me to remind everyone that the UBCM happens once a year. Uh, we're not, uh, we're not meeting once a year. We're meeting every couple of weeks. Uh, and it hasn't been an issue so far. So again, I'd come back to my argument about why do something by halves, you can do it by quarters. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, as I think is what Councillor Prina was hinting I should say. So I'm still supportive of uh, what we're. All right, seeing no further speakers, call the questions. All in favor? Mayor Crow, Councillor Eastmere, Councillor Prino, Council Gezerbeck, those opposed? Armstrong and Hammonds, motion carries. Thank you. Moving on, Ms. Robertson. Okay. Uh, the next section is just an easy one. It's to section 19.10, which is just, it's redundant. Uh, it's not necessary and can be removed. Uh, so it's housekeeping in nature. And when the bylaw comes forward, we'll just have that as a, as a straight through. Uh, the next one for consideration, and this uh, speaks to Councillor Gesselbrecht's question, Hello. which is um, delegations unrelated to en agenda items where council could uh, consider either five minutes or three minutes. So the first recommendation would be uh, to change it from five to three minutes, and the second recommendation is to retain the status quo of five minutes, and this is for delegations unrelated to agenda topics. Do we have a motion, council? What do you move? I move the status quo. Moved by Councillor Gesbrecht, seconded by Councillor Prino. Any discussion? See none called the question, all in favor? Unanimous. Next one, please. Okay, section 1915A should really match what we were just uh, talking about previously about the public hearings where there was the two choices, uh, where the matter relates to a bylaw and, and respect of which a public hearing or statutory hearing has already been held or where third reading has been held or the option two. And council selected, or the committee selected option two last time, so it should be married in this um, section as well. So a, a motion to select the second one would be appropriate. Moved by Council Prino, seconded by Council Eastmere. Any discussion? Seeing none, call the question. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. Thank you. Sorry, um, Madam Chair, can we just move the slide up? I think we're on to a different section. We're at 19.15. We're on 19.15 now. Thank you. Okay. And it's on page 60 to your agenda? Page 5 on eScribe. 
so section 19.4B under delegations authorizes the corporate officer to screen delegation requests and refuse to put a delegation on if they have already spoken to council on the same matter and no new significant information is provided. So this same provision should actually match in this area as well. So it's just a housekeeping amendment to include it so that it appears in both um, areas where delegations are covered. So uh, looking for a recommendation from the committee to direct staff to add section 19.15K to council's procedure bylaw, which states if the delegation has already spoken to council on the same matter and no new significant information is provided. Moved by Council Perino, seconded by Councillor Hammonds. Any discussion? Councillor Hammonds. Thank you, Chair. I'm just curious, our, our, um, so it's going to be up to staff to judge that the delegation has no new significant information. How do we do that? That's a heavy responsibility. Our, our corporate officer is really good at sussing that out. <laughs> and she's very generous, I have to say, that if there's even a little bit of wriggle, uh, uh, Ms. Gurry uh, allows the delegation to appear. Okay, so we're, le we're lenient, is what yeah. you're saying? Yes. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, so has it been moved yeah. and seconded? Anybody uh, have any further comments? Seeing none, call the question all in favor? Any opposed, seeing none opposed, motion carries. Um, so the next one is section 19.17C, which is on page 60 of the agenda. And best practices are such that council should not act on a request from a delegation following a presentation and instead refer the matter to staff for a report or utilize the notice of motion provision to give council and staff the opportunity to look into the matter in more detail. And while this is not an issue with this council, other local governments have this provision included in their council procedure bylaw. And uh, so staff would just think as a proactive measure to add in the section um, to not to have the inclusion of the words not act on a request from a delegation following the presentation unless consent by two-thirds vote of council present is given. Moved by Councillor Prino. Do I have a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Hammonds. Discussion? Councillor Hammonds. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm happy to support, but I do just want to note that this ties our hands a bit, and I'm, I'm just... Um, not really. Uh, well, I disagree. Okay. I, 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 I think this is probably great governance and good manners, but... Um, I, I always think um, those should be up to council and not necessarily embedded in bylaw, but I'm happy to support. Council Gesbrock, you're muted. Just a, a question on this. So basically this would say like if a delegation came and made a request for that request to be granted without a motion to refer to staff for a report, you'd need a two thirds vote as opposed to a majority vote. Council could also say that I'd like to put a notice of motion on the table to address that so that it could come back to the next meeting. So that right. Would... Did I answer right. Question? So it just, it just in the moment, in the moment, if you want to make a decision as council in that moment, that that That's that two -thirds, meeting, yes. you would need two thirds. You could yes. still do it, but you just need two thirds. Okay. Correct. I mean that ups the threshold a little bit, but so yeah, I, I'm Ms. Gurry. Yes. Um. Thank you, Chair. And just through you to the committee, I think the um, the the reason or rationale behind this, and as well as best practices, like Ms. Robertson was saying was to not give the expectation to the delegation that you would be acting on it, giving you that leeway to not, to have it in your rule, to not have to act upon it, not have that expectation. So more for their, them and their expectations, not, not handcuffing you in your abilities to make that decision. It, but again, it's, it's totally up to you. It's also in the other, that, that wording is in the other delegation section. So again, we're just making them match. Okay, so we've moved in second. Councilor Grisbrook, do you have something else or is that a holdover? No, holdover. Okay. Call the question, all those in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none opposed, motion carries. Next one, please. Okay, we're almost getting there. So this one relates to question period and it's on page 61, section 23.1 in the procedure bylaw. And the intent of question period is for members of the public to ask questions on matters considered by council at the meeting. And most questions should be able to be asked within three minutes. And uh, the mayor can always give opportunities for members to ask more than one question. So just looking for council's feedback and thoughts on reducing the question for each uh, individual question from five minutes to three minutes. Mayor Krug. 
Uh, can candidly, I, I wasn't even aware we had a five minute limit on <laughs> questions. Yeah, I've probably let it drift on longer than that on occasion with some of our more frequent flyers. So um, I, I think it's an interesting proposition. I'm, I'm gonna think about that and leave others for to comment. Uh, for me, if we're doing everything else five minutes, I think we should be staying five minutes for question period as a matter of fairness. So I would not be in favor of three minutes. I'd, I'd be sticking with the five. Okay. Moved by Councillor Hammond, oh, uh, option two. Seconder. Seconded by Councilor Prino. So the motion on the floor is that the Governance and Priorities Committee recommend the Council retain question period at five minutes. Councilor Giesbrook. Um, Pat, that, that's funny the comments made earlier. I'd actually be supportive of reducing this one down to three minutes. I, I find that question period gets used uh, as being a delegation often. And if you can't get your question out in three minutes, then you're, 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 you're trying to make a presentation. So I, I would be inclined to vote this one down. No, I'm not supportive of Keeping it five, and uh, if it fails, I'd put forward a three minute. Thank you. Mayor Croak. Uh, thank you, Chair. And, and just to be clear, it says questions will be addressed through the mayor and council. Uh, members will respond within a three minute time limit. That's limits on us. No. Oh. Am I, mis am I no, misreading no. this? No, no. Um, Madam Chair, the, the whole the person comes up to the podium, asks their questions, and has their response in five minutes. That's what the procedure bylaw yeah. means right now. Three so the, the question and the answer is done in five minutes. So uh, I don't, if three minutes doesn't give any other, it only really gives one counselor a chance to reply or somebody, so the five gives more option. Fair, I didn't, I misunderstood. I withdraw my comments. <laughs> Are you withdrawing? No, I'm, I'm curious now. Thank, thank you. I'm hearing two different things. So the report says most questions should be able to ask within a three-minute time period. So that indicates that we're speaking about the time at the podium for the public. But Ms. Gurry is now saying that it's actually wrapping in our response as well. So if I could just have a clarification, why would we mention that you should be able to get your questions out in three minutes if this is, relates to council's time to respond to the question? And that might be my error in under misunderstanding how the question period was. Ms. Gurry speak now. Yeah. I thought it was up to five minutes um, for the first thing. Yeah, that, I'll take the responsibility for that because I was around when the question period went to the five minutes and it was for the question to be asked and responded to. So I must not have made that clear to Ms. Robertson or caught that in her report. So it definitely <laughs> is five minutes for the question to be asked and responded to. And so it's not... Um, um, they should answer, ask their question and have it addressed in three to five minutes. It's not all of that time just for the question itself. Follow up, Ms. Hammond, or Councillor Hammonds? No, I know it's okay. Mayor Krogh? Uh, Chair, I, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that we actually have a limit on the verbose mayor's responses to questions, so uh, <laughs> I would suggest leaving it at five, and I might even consider going to three, as Councillor Gesselbrock initially <laughs> thought he might support. So. Ms. Councillor Perino? Chair, I actually feel somewhat insulted as an elected official. I, if I choose to take the time and the mayor allows me to take the time, I'll take it. So I'll keep it with the five. Call the question, all those in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none opposed, motion carries. Next one, please. Okay. The next one relates to section 50.4 and 50.5, which is on page 69 of your agenda package. And this is just a housekeeping matter and we're just tidying up the process uh, for the committees um, by adding, uh, under 50.4, we're just adding in the words on a matter related to the agenda. Because uh, previously it was asking to have delegations be well in advance and not give them the opportunity to put in a delegation request when, they, when the agenda came out and also um, to address sort of the addendums where we get information the day before the meeting. So this is... Uh, Moved by Councillor yeah. Hammond, seconder. Second, Councillor Prino, any discussion? Seeing none, call the question. All in favor? Motion carried. Next one. Okay, second last one. Uh, this relates to section 51.9, 51.10, and 51.11, and these are just new recommendations, more to do proactively with uh, checking for uh, mi minutes accuracy. And again, this is not uh, an issue with this council at all. It's, it's proactive. I've seen it in the past, and so it is 
good to have a process in place of how you would address discrepancies in the minutes. Um, it sometimes happens more on the committee side, but uh, yeah, this would just look for um, a section to say that the council may make a motion and just really to advise the corporate officer an hour before the meeting so that they can look at the tape. Moved by Councillor Hammond, seconded by Mayor Krogh. Any discussion? Seeing none, call the question. All in favor? Seeing none opposed, motion carries. Last one. And the final one is, uh, this is just really to tidy up. Uh, when we changed the uh, public hearing process policy, it didn't match the council procedure bylaw, so now we just need to marry the two and um, make that change there, which is housekeeping. Moved, moved by Councillor Hammond, second by Councillor Eastmere. Any discussion or questions? Go ahead. Uh, chair, thank you so much. Uh, question through you. the chair. Are we talking, uh, because with a public hearing, it's always the mayor that's at the table? Generally, but it... Um, so uh, that, that was why I was just concerned about the, the term, the chair. Oh, it doesn't have to be the mayor, no. No, the chair. It could be any council member okay. that, chair. that okay. chairs that meeting. Okay, thank you. Seeing no other discussion, called question all in favor. Seeing none opposed, motion carried unanimously. Thank you very much. All right, and that concludes my presentation, and these motions will go forward to the next council meeting and then Good back work. with the bylaw on the Thank, Thank you for your patience. So short-term rentals have been removed, so question period, Ms. Gurry? Seeing none, motion to adjourn. Moved by Mayor Croke, seconded by Councillor Eastmere. All in favor? Motion carries. Thank you all. Job well done. Didn't get our break-in, but we can go home earlier.